Chapter One of Bill Nye's Funniest Thoughts. Directions. This book is not designed specially for any one class of people. It is for all. It is a universal repository of thought. Some of my best thoughts are contained in this book. Whenever I would think a thought that I thought had better remained unthought, I would omit it from this book. For that reason the book is not so large as I had intended. When a man coldly and dispassionately goes at it to eradicate from his work all that may not come up to his standard of merit, he can make a large volume shrink till it is no thicker than the bank book of an outspoken clergyman. This is the fourth book that I have published in response to the clamorous appeals of the public. Whenever the public got to clamoring too loudly for a new book from me, and it got so noisy that I could not ignore it any more, I would issue another volume. The first was a red book, succeeded by a dark blue volume, after which I published a green book, all of which were kindly received by the American people and, under the present yielding system of international copyright, greedily snapped up by some of the tottering dynasties. But I had long hoped to publish a larger, better, and, if possible, a redder book than the first, one that would contain my better thoughts, thoughts that I had thought when I was feeling well, thoughts that I had emitted when my thinker was rearing up on its hind feet, if I may be allowed that term, thoughts that sprang forth with a wild whoop and demanded recognition. This book is the result of that hope and that wish. It is my greatest and best book. It is the one that will live for weeks after other books have passed away. Even to those who cannot read, it will come like a benison when there is no benison in the house. To the ignorant, the pictures will be pleasing. The wise will revel in its wisdom, and the housekeeper will find that with it she may easily emphasize a statement or kill a cockroach. The range of subjects treated in this book is wonderful even to me. It is a library of universal knowledge, and the facts contained in it are different from any other facts now in use. I have carefully guarded all the way through against using hackneyed and moth-eaten facts. As a result, I am able to come before the people with a set of new and attractive statements, so fresh and so crisp that an unkind word would wither them in a moment. I believe there is nothing more to add, except that I most heartily endorse the book. It has been carefully read over by the proofreader and myself, so we do not ask the public to do anything that we are not willing to do ourselves. I cannot be responsible for the board of orphans whose parents read this book and leave their children in destitute circumstances. Bill Nye End of Directions Chapter 2 of Bill Nye's Funniest Thoughts by Bill Nye Chapter 2 My School Days Looking over my own school days, there are so many things that I would rather not tell that it will take very little time and space for me to use in telling what I am willing that the carping public should know about my early history. I began my educational career in a log schoolhouse. Finding that other great men had done that way, I began early to look around me for a log schoolhouse where I could begin, in a small way, to soak my system full of hard words and information. For a time I learned very rapidly. Learning came to me with very little effort at first. I would read my lesson over once or twice and then take my place in the class. It never bothered me to recite my lesson and so I stood at the head of the class. I would stick my big toe through a knot-hole in the floor and work out the most difficult problem. This became at last a habit with me. 
With my knot-hole I was safe. Without it I would hesitate. A large red-headed boy with feet like summer squash and eyes like those of a dead codfish was my rival. He soon discovered that I was very dependent on that knot-hole, so one night he stole into the schoolhouse and plugged up the knot-hole, so that I could not work my toe into it and thus refresh my memory. Then the large red-headed boy who had not formed the knot-hole habit went to the head of the class and remained there. After I grew larger, my parents sent me to a military school. That is where I got the fine military learning and stately carriage that I still wear. My room was on the second floor, and it was very difficult for me to leave it at night because the turnkey locked us up at nine o'clock every evening. Still, I used to get out once in a while and wander around in the starlight. I do not know yet why I did it, but I presume it was a kind of somnambulism. I would go to bed thinking so intently of my lessons that I would get up and wander away, sometimes for miles, in the solemn night. One night I awoke and found myself in a watermelon patch. I was never so ashamed in my life. It is a very serious thing to be awakened so rudely out of a sound sleep by a bulldog, to find yourself in the watermelon vineyard of a man with whom you are not acquainted. I was not on terms of social intimacy with this man or his dog. They did not belong to our set. We had never been thrown together before. After that I was called the Great Sonambulist, and men who had watermelon conservatories shunned me. But it cured me of my sonambulism. I have never tried to sonambulate any more since that time. There are other little incidents of my school days that come trooping up in my memory at this moment, but they were not startling in their nature. Mine is but the history of one who struggled on, year after year, trying to do better, but most always failing to connect. The boys of Boston would do well to study my record and then do differently. End of chapter 2 My School Days Chapter 3 of Bill Nye's Funniest Thoughts by Bill Nye Chapter 3 Habits of a Literary Man The editor of an Eastern Health magazine, having asked for information relative to the habits, hours of work, and style and frequency of feed adopted by literary men, and several parties having responded who were no more essentially saturated with literature than I am, I now take my pen in hand to reveal the true inwardness of my literary life, so that boys, who may yearn to follow in my footsteps and wear a laurel wreath the year round in place of a hat, may know what the personal habits of a literary party are. I rise from bed the first thing in the morning, leaving my couch not because I am dissatisfied with it, but because I cannot carry it with me during the day. I then seat myself on the edge of the bed and devote a few moments to thought. Literary men who have never set aside a few moments on rising for thought will do well to try it. I then insert myself into a pair of middle-aged pantaloons. It is needless to say that girls who may have a literary tendency will find little to interest them here. Outer clothing is added to the above from time to time. I then bathe myself. Still, this is not absolutely essential to a literary life. Others who do not do so have been equally successful. Some literary people bathe before dressing. I then go downstairs and out to the barn where I feed the horse. Some literary men feel above taking care of a horse, because there is really nothing in common between the care of a horse and literature. But simplicity is my watchword. T. Jefferson would have to rise early in the day to eclipse me in simplicity. I wish I had as many dollars as I have got simplicity. 
I then go in to breakfast. This meal consists almost wholly of food. I am passionately fond of food, and I may truly say, with my hand on my heart, that I owe much of my great success in life to this inward craving, this constant yearning for something better. During this meal I frequently converse with my family. I do not feel above my family, at least if I do, I try to conceal it as much as possible. Buckwheat pancakes in a heated state, with maple syrup on the upper side, are extremely conducive to literature. Nothing jerks the mental facilities around with greater rapidity than buckwheat pancakes. After breakfast the time is put in to good advantage, looking forward to the time when dinner will be ready. From 8 to 10 a.m., however, I frequently retire to my private library hotbed in the haymow, and write twelve hundred words in my forthcoming book, the price of which will be two dollars fifty in cloth and four dollars with Russian back. I then play Copenhagen with some little girls twenty-one years of age, who live nearby and of whom I am passionately fond. After that I dig some worms, with a view to angling. I then angle. After this I return home, waiting until dusk, however, as I do not like to attract attention. Nothing is more distasteful to a truly good man of wonderful literary acquirements, and yet with singular modesty, than the coarse and rude scrutiny of the vulgar herd. In winter I do not angle. I read The Pirate Prince, or The Missourian's Mash, or some other work, not so much for the plot as the style, that I may get my mind into correct channels of thought. I then play old sledge in a rambling sort of manner. I sometimes spend an evening at home in order to excite remark, and draw attention to my wonderful eccentricity. I do not use alcohol in any form, if I know it, though sometimes I am basely deceived by those who know of my peculiar prejudice, and who do it too because they enjoy watching my odd and amusing antics at the time. Alcohol should be avoided entirely by literary workers, especially young women. There can be no more pitiable sight to the tender-hearted than a young woman of marked ability writing an obituary poem while under the influence of liquor. I knew a young man who was a good writer. His penmanship was very good indeed. He once wrote an article for the press while under the influence of liquor. He sent it to the editor, who returned it at once with a cold and cruel letter, every line of which was a stab. The letter came at a time when he was full of remorse. He tossed up a cent to see whether he should blow out his brains or go into the ready-made clothing business. The coin decided that he should die by his own hand, but his head ached so that he didn't feel like shooting into it. So he went into the ready-made clothing business, and now he pays taxes on $75,000, so he is probably worth $150,000. This, of course, salves over his wounded heart, but he often says to me that he might have been in the literary business today if he had let liquor alone. End of chapter 3 Habits of a Literary Man Chapter 4 of Bill Nye's Funniest Thoughts by Bill Nye Archimedes Archimedes whose given name has been accidentally torn off and swallowed up in oblivion, was born in Syracuse 2,171 years ago last spring. He was a philosopher and mathematical expert. During his life he was never successfully stumped in figures. It ill befits me now, standing by his new-made grave, to say aught of him that is not of praise. We can only mourn his untimely death, and wonder which of our little band of great men will be the next to go. Archimedes was the first to originate and use the word Eureka. It has been successfully used very much lately, 
and as a result we have the Eureka Baking Powder and Eureka Suspender, the Eureka Bed Bug Buster, the Eureka Shirt, and the Eureka Stomach Bitters. Little did Archimedes wot when he invented this term that it would come into such general use. Its origin has been explained before, but it would not be out of place here for me to tell it as I call it to mind now, looking back over Archie's eventful life. King Hiero had ordered an eighteen-carry crown, size seven and one-eighth, and after receiving it from the hands of the jeweler, suspected that it had been adulterated. He therefore applied to Archimedes to ascertain, if possible, whether such was the case or not. Archimedes had just got in on number three, two hours late and covered with dust. He at once started for a hot and cold bath emporium on Sixteenth Street, meantime wondering how the dickens he would settle that crown business. He filled the bathtub level full and, piling up his raiment on the floor, jumped in. Displacing a large quantity of water, equal to his own bulk, he thereupon solved the question of specific gravity, and, forgetting his bill, forgetting his clothes, he sailed up Sixteenth Street and all over Syracuse, clothed in shimmering sunlight and a plain gold ring, shouting, Eureka! He ran head first into a Syracuse policeman and howled, Eureka! The policeman said, You'll have to excuse me, I don't know him. He scattered the Syracuse Normal School on its way home, and tried to board a Fifteenth Street bobtail car yelling, Eureka! The car driver told him that Eureka wasn't on the car, and referred Archimedes to a clothing store. Everywhere he was greeted with surprise. He tried to pay his car fare, but found that he had left his money in his other clothes. Some thought it was the revised statute of Hercules that he had become weary of standing on his pedestal during the hot weather, and had started out for fresh air. I give this as I remember it. The story is foundered on fact. Archimedes once said, Give me where I may stand, and I will move the world. I could write it in the original Greek, but, fearing that the nonpareil delirium tremens type might get short, I give it in the English language. It may be tardy justice to a great mathematician and a scientist, but I have a few resolutions of respect which I would be very glad to get printed on this solemn occasion, and mail copies of the paper to his relatives and friends. Whereas it has pleased an all-wise providence to remove from our midst Archimedes, who was ever at the front in all deserving labors and enterprises, and, whereas, we can but feebly express our great sorrow in the loss of Archimedes, whose front name has escaped our memory, therefore resolved that in his death we have lost a leading citizen of Syracuse, and one who never shook his friends, never weakened or gigged back on those he loved. Resolved that copies of these resolutions will be spread on the moments of the meeting of the Common Council of Syracuse, and that they be published in the Syracuse papers, EODT, PFQ, and COD, and that marked copies of said papers be mailed to the relatives of the deceased. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Bill Nye's Funniest Thoughts by Bill Nye Chapter 5 Anatomy The word anatomy is derived from two Greek spatters and three polywogs, which, when translated, signify up through and to cut, so that anatomy actually, when translated from the original wappy-jawed Greek, means to cut up through. That is no doubt the reason why the medical student proceeds to cut up through the entire course. Anatomy is so called because its best results are obtained from the cutting or dissecting of organism. For that reason, there is a growing demand in the neighborhood of the medical college for good second-hand organisms, 
Parties having well-preserved organisms that they are not actually using will do well to call at the side door of the medical college after 10 p.m. The branch of the comparative anatomy which seeks to trace the unities of plan which are exhibited in diverse organisms, and which discovers, as far as may be, the principles which govern the growth and development of organized bodies, and which finds functional analogies and structural homologies, is denominated philosophical or transcendental anatomy. This statement, though strictly true, is not original with me. Careful study of the human organism after death shows traces of functional analogies and structural homologies in people who were supposed to have been in perfect health all their lives, probably many of those we meet in the daily walks of life, many too who wear a smile and outwardly seem happy, have either one or both of these things. A man may live a false life and deceive his most intimate friends in the matter of anatomical analogies or homologies. But he cannot conceal it from the eagle eye of the medical student. The ambitious medical student makes a specialty of true inwardness. The study of the structure of animals is called zootomy. The attempt to study the anatomical structure of the grizzly bear from the inside has not been crowned with success. When the anatomizer and the bear have been thrown together casually, it has generally been a struggle between the two organisms to see which would make a study of the structure of the other. Zootomy and moral suasion are not homogeneous, analogous, nor indigenous. Vegetable anatomy is called phytonomy, sometimes, but it would not be safe to address a vigorous man by that epithet. We may call a vegetable that, however, and be safe. Human anatomy is that branch of anatomy which enters into the description of the structure and geographical distribution of the elements of a human being. It also applies to the structure of the microbe that crawls out of every jail every four years, just long enough to whip his wife, vote, and go back again. Human anatomy is either general, specific, topographical, or surgical. These terms do not imply the dissection and anatomy of generals, specialists, topographers, and surgeons, as they might seem to imply but really means something else. I would explain here what they actually do mean if I had more room and knew enough to do it. Anatomists divide their science, as well as their subjects, into fragments. Osteology treats of the skeleton, myology of the muscles, angiology of the blood vessels, Splankology, the digestive organs or department of the interior, and so on. People tell pretty tough stories of the young carvists who study anatomy on subjects taken from life. I would repeat a few of them here, but they are productive of insomnia, so I will not give them. I visited a matinee of this kind once for a short time, but I have not been there since. When I have a holiday now, the idea of spending it in the dissecting room of a large and flourishing medical college does not occur to me. I never could be a successful surgeon, I fear. While I have no hesitation about mutilating the English, I have scruples about cutting up other nationalities. I should always fear, while pursuing my studies, that I might be called upon to dissect a friend, and I could not do that. I should like to do anything that would advance the cause of science, but I should not want to form the habit of dissecting people, lest some day I might be called upon to dissect a friend for whom I had a great attachment, or some creditor who had an attachment for me. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Bill Nye's Funniest Thoughts by Bill Nye Chapter 6 Hours with great men. I presume that I could write an entire library of personal reminiscences relative to the eminent people with whom I have been thrown during a busy life, 
But I hate to do it, because I always regarded such things as sacred from the vulgar eye, and I felt bound to respect the confidence of a prominent man just as much as I would that of one who was less before the people. I remember very well my first meeting with General W. T. Sherman. I would not mention it here if it were not for the fact that the people seemed to be so yearning for personal reminiscences of great men, and that is perfectly right, too. It was during the war that I met General Sherman, and it was on the line of the Union Pacific Railway, at one of those justly celebrated eating-houses which I understand are now abandoned. The colored waiter had cut off a strip of the omelette with a pair of shears, the scorched oatmeal had been passed around, the little rubber doormats fried in butter and called pancakes had been dealt around the table, and the cashier at the end of the hall had just gone through the clothes of a party from Vermont who claimed a rebate on the ground that the waiter had refused to bring him anything but his bill. There was no sound in the dining-room except the weak requests of the coffee for more air and stimulants, or perhaps the cry of pain when the butter, while practicing with the dumbbells, would hit a child on the head. Then all would be still again. General Sherman sat at one end of the table, throwing a life-preserver to a fly in the milk-pitcher. We had never met before, though for years we had been plodding along life's rugged way, he in the War Department, I in the Post Office Department. Unknown to each other, we had been holding up opposite corners of the great national fabric, if you will allow me that expression. I remember, as well as though it were but yesterday, how the conversation began. General Sherman looked sternly at me and said, "'I wish you would overpower that butter and send it up this way.' "'All right,' said I, "'if you will please pass those molasses.' That was all that was said, but I shall never forget it, and probably he never will. The conversation was brief, but yet how full of food for thought! How true, how earnest, how natural! Nothing stilted or false about it. It was the natural expression of two minds that were too great to be verbose or to monkey with social conversational flapdoodle. I remember once a great while ago I was asked by a friend to go with him in the evening to the house of an acquaintance, where they were going to have a kind of musicale at which there was to be some noted pianist, who had kindly consented to play a few strains. I did not get the name of the professional, but I went, and when the first piece was announced, I saw that the light was very uncertain, so I kindly volunteered to get a lamp from another room. I held that big lamp, weighing about twenty-nine pounds, for half an hour, while the pianist would tinky-tinky up on the right hand, or bangy-boomy to bang down on the bass, while he snorted and slugged that old concert grand piano, had almost knocked its teeth down its throat, or gently dawdled with the keys like a pale moonbeam shimmering through the bleached rafters of a deceased house, until at last there was a wild jangle such as the accomplished musician gives to an instrument to show the audience that he has disabled the piano, and will take a slight intermission while it is sent to the junk-shop. With a sigh of relief I carefully put down the twenty-nine-pound lamp, and my friend told me that I had been standing there like liberty enlightening the world, and holding that heavy lamp for blind Tom. I had never seen him before and I slipped out of the room before he had a chance to see me. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 B. Franklin Deceased Benjamin Franklin, formerly of Boston, came very near being an only child. If seventeen children had not come to bless the home of Benjamin's parents, they would have been childless. 
think of getting up in the morning and picking up your shoes and stockings from among seventeen pairs of them. Imagine yourself a child, gentle reader, in a family where you would be called upon every morning to select your own cud of spruce gum from a collection of seventeen similar cuds stuck on a window-sill. And yet B. Franklin never murmured or repined. He desired to go to sea, and to avoid this he was apprenticed to his brother James, who was a printer. It is said that Franklin at once took hold of the great Archimedean lever, and jerked it early and late in the interests of freedom. It is claimed that Franklin at this time invented the deadly weapon known as the printer's towel. He found that a common crash towel could be saturated with glue, molasses, antimony, concentrated lye, and roller composition, and that, after a few years of time and perspiration, it would harden so that the constant reader or veritas could be stabbed with it and die soon. Many believe that Franklin's other scientific experiments were productive of more lasting benefit to mankind than this, but I do not agree with them. This paper was called the New England Courant. It was edited jointly by James and Benjamin Franklin, and was started to supply a long-felt want. Benjamin edited a part of the time, and James a part of the time. The idea of having two editors was not for the purpose of giving volume to the editorial page, but it was necessary for one to run the paper while the other was in jail. In those days you couldn't sass the king, and then when the king came into the office the next day and stopped his paper and took out his ad, you couldn't put it off on our informant and go right along with the paper. You had to go to jail, while your subscribers wondered why their paper did not come and the paste soured in the tin dippers in the sanctum, and the circus passed by on the other side. How many of us today, fellow journalists, would be willing to stay in jail while the lawn festival and the kangaroo came and went? Who of all our company would go to a prison cell for the cause of freedom while a double-column ad of sixteen aggregated circuses and eleven congresses of ferocious beasts, fierce and fragrant from their native lair, went by us. At the age of seventeen Ben got disgusted with his brother, and went to Philadelphia and New York, where he got a chance to sub for a few weeks, and then got a regular sit. Franklin was a good printer, and finally got to be a foreman. He made an excellent foreman, sitting by the hour in the composing room and spitting on the stone, while he cussed the make-up and press work of the other papers. Then he would go into the editorial rooms, and scare the editors to death with a wild shriek for more copy. He knew just how to conduct himself as a foreman, so that strangers would think he owned the paper. In 1730, at the age of twenty-four, Franklin married and established the Pennsylvania Gazette. He was then regarded as a great man, and most everyone took his paper. Franklin grew to be a great journalist, and spelled hard words with great fluency. He never tried to be a humorist in any of his newspaper work, and everybody respected him. Along about 1746 he began to study the construction and habits of lightning, and inserted a local in his paper in which he said that he would be obliged to any of his readers who might notice any new or odd specimens of lightning if they would send them into the Gazette office by express for examination. Every time there was a thunderstorm, Franklin would tell the foreman to edit the paper, and, armed with a string and an old fruit jar, he would go out on the hills and get enough lightning for a mess. In 1753 Franklin was made postmaster general of the colonies. He made a good postmaster, and people said there were less mistakes in distributing their mail than there has been ever since. If a man mailed a letter in those days, 
Old Ben Franklin saw that it went where it was addressed. Franklin frequently went over to England in those days, partly on business and partly to shock the king. He used to delight in going to the castle with his breeches tucked in his boots, figuratively speaking, and attract a good deal of attention. It looked odd to the English, of course, to see him come into the royal presence and, leaving his wet umbrella up against the throne, ask the king, "'How's trade?' Franklin never put on any frills, but he was not afraid of a crowned head. He used to say frequently that to him a king was no more than a seven-spot. He did his best to prevent the Revolutionary War, but he couldn't do it. Patrick Henry had said that the war was inevitable, and given it permission to come, and it came. He also went to Paris and got acquainted with a few crowned heads there. They thought a good deal of him in Paris, and offered him a corner lot if he would build there and start a paper. They also promised him the county printing, but he said no. He would have to go back to America, or his wife might get uneasy about him. Franklin wrote Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732 through 57, and it was republished in England. Benjamin Franklin had but one son, and his name was William. William was an illegitimate son, and, though he lived to be quite an old man, he never got over it entirely, but continued to be an illegitimate son all his life. Everybody urged him to do differently, but he steadily refused to do so. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Life Insurance as a Health Restorer Life insurance is a great thing. I would not be without it. My health is greatly improved since I got my new policy. Formerly I used to have a seal-brown taste in my mouth when I arose in the morning, but that has entirely disappeared. I am more hopeful and happy, and my hair is getting thicker on top. I would not try to keep house without life insurance. Last September I was caught in one of the most destructive cyclones that ever visited a Republican form of government. A great deal of property was destroyed, and many lives were lost, but I was spared. People who had no insurance were mowed down on every hand, but Aside from a broken leg, I was entirely unharmed. I look upon life insurance as a great comfort, not only to the beneficiary, but to the insured, who very rarely lives to realize anything pecuniarily from his venture. Twice I have almost raised my wife to affluence, and cast a gloom over the community in which I lived. But something happened to the physician for a few days, so that he could not attend me, and I recovered. For nearly two years I was under the doctor's care. He had his finger on my pulse or in my pocket all the time. He was a young Western physician, who attended me on Tuesdays and Fridays. The rest of the week he devoted his medical skill to horses that were mentally broken down. He said he attended me largely for my society. I felt flattered to know that he enjoyed my society after he had been thrown among horses all the week that had much greater advantages than I. My wife at first objected seriously to an insurance on my life, and said she would never, never touch a dollar of the money if I were to die, but after I had been sick nearly two years, and my disposition had suffered a good deal, she said that I need not delay the obsequies on that account. But the life insurance slipped through my fingers somehow, and I recovered. In these days of dynamite and roller rinks, and the gory meat acts of a new administration, we ought to make some provision for the future. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 The Opium Habit 
I have always had a horror of opiates of all kinds. They are so seductive and so still in their operations. They steal through the blood like a wolf on the trail, and they seize upon the heart at last with their white fangs till it is still for ever. Up the Laramie there is a cluster of ranches at the base of the Medicine Bow, near the north end of Sheep Mountain, and in sight of the glittering eternal frost of the snowy range. These ranches are the homes of the young men from Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, and now there are several younger sons of old England, with herds of horses, steers, and sheep worth millions of dollars. These young men are not of the kind of whom the metropolitan ass writes as saying, You bet your life, and calling everybody Padna. They are many of them college graduates who can brand a wild maverick or furnish the easy gestures for a Strauss waltz. They wear human clothes, talk in the United States language, and have a bank account. This spring they may be wearing chaperos and swinging a quirt through the thin air, and in July they may be at Long Branch or coloring a meerschaum pipe among the Alps. Well, a young man, whom we will call Curtis, lived at one of these ranches years ago, and, though a quiet, mind-your-own-business fellow, who had absolutely no enemies among his companions, he had the misfortune to incur the wrath of a tramp sheep-herder, who waylaid Curtis one afternoon and shot him dead as he sat in his buggy. Curtis wasn't armed. He didn't dream of trouble till he drove home from town, and as he passed through the gates of a corral, saw the hairy face of the herder, and at the same moment the flash of a Winchester rifle. That was all. A rancher came into town and telegraphed to Curtis's father, and then a half-dozen citizens went out to help capture the herder, who had fled to the sagebrush of the foothills. They didn't get back till toward daybreak, but they brought the herder with them. I saw him in the gray of the morning, lying in a coarse gray blanket on the floor of the engine-house. He was dead. I asked, as a reporter, how he came to his death, and they told me, Opium. I said, Did I understand you to say ropium? They said, No, it was opium. The murderer had taken poison when he found that escape was impossible. I was present at the inquest, so that I could report the case. There was very little testimony, but all the evidence seemed to point to the fact that life was extinct, and a verdict of death by his own hand was rendered. It was the first opium work I had ever seen, and it aroused my curiosity. Death by opium, it seems leaves a dark purple ring around the neck. I did not know this before. People who die by opium also tie their hands together before they die. This is one of the eccentricities of opium poisoning that I have never seen laid down in the books. I bequeath it to medical science. Whenever I run up against a new scientific discovery, I just hand it right over to the public without cost. Ever since the above incident, I have been very apprehensive about people who seem to be likely to form the opium habit. It is one of the most deadly of narcotics, especially in a new country. High up in the pure mountain atmosphere, this man could not secure enough air to prolong life, and he expired. In a land where clear, crisp air and delightful scenery are abundant, he turned his back upon them both and passed away. Is it not sad to contemplate? End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Twombly's Tale My name is Twombly. G.O.P. Twombly is my full name. And I have had a checkered career. I thought it would be best to have my career checked right through, so I did so. My home is in the Wasatch Mountains, 
far up where I can see the long green winding valley of the Jordan, like a glorious panorama below me I dwell. I keep a large herd of Angora goats. That is my business. The Angora goat is a beautiful animal, in a picture. But out of a picture he has a style of perspiration that invites adverse criticism. Still, it is an independent life, and one that has its advantages, too. When I first came to Utah, I saw one day in Salt Lake City a young girl arrive. She was in the heyday of life, but she couldn't talk our language. Her face was oval, rather longer than it was wide, I noticed, and though she was still young, there were traces of care and other foreign substances plainly written there. She was an immigrant, about seventeen years of age, and though she had been in Salt Lake City an hour and a half, she was still unmarried. She was about medium height, with blue eyes that somehow, as you examine them carefully in the full ruddy light of a glorious September afternoon, seemed to resemble each other. Both of them were that way. I do not know what gave me the courage, but I stepped to her side and, in a low voice, told her of my love, and asked her to be mine. She looked askance at me. Nobody ever did that before and lived to tell the tale. But her sex made me overlook it. Had she been any other sex that I can think of, I would have resented it. But I would not strike a woman especially when I had not been married to her and had no right to do so. I turned on my heel, and I went away. I almost always turn on my heel when I go away. If I did not turn on my own heel when I went away, whose heel would a lonely man like me turn upon? Years rolled by. I did nothing to prevent it. Still that face came to me in my lonely hut far up in the mountains. That look still rankled in my memory. Before that my memory had been all right. Nothing had ever rankled it very much. Let the careless reader who never had his memory rankle in hot weather pass this by. This story is not for him. After our conversation we did not meet again for three years, and then, by the merest accident, I had been out for a whole afternoon hunting an elderly goat that had grown childish and irresponsible. He had wandered away, and for several days I had been unable to find him. So I sought for him till darkness found me several miles from my cabin. I realized at once that I must hurry back or lose my way and spend the night in the mountains. The darkness became more rapidly obvious. My way became more and more uncertain. Finally I fell down an old prospect shaft. I then resolved to remain where I was until I could decide what was best to be done. If I had known that the prospect shaft was there I would have gone another way. There was another way that I could have gone, but it did not occur to me until too late. I hated to spend the next few weeks in the shaft, for I had not locked up my cabin when I left it, and I feared that someone might get in while I was absent and play on the piano. I had also set a batch of bread and two hens that morning, and all of these would be in sad need of me before I could get my business into such shape that I could return. I could not tell accurately how long I had been in the shaft, for I had no matches by which to see my watch. I also had no watch. All at once someone fell down the shaft. I knew that it was a woman, because she did not swear when she landed at the bottom. Still, this could be accounted for in another way. She was unconscious when I picked her up. I did not know what to do. I was perfectly beside myself, and so was she. I had read in novels that when a woman becomes unconscious people generally chafed her hands, but I did not know whether I ought to chafe the hands of a person to whom I had never been introduced. 
I could have administered alcoholic stimulants to her, but I had neglected to provide myself with them when I fell down the shaft. This should be a warning to people who habitually go around the country without alcoholic stimulants. Finally she breathed a long sigh and murmured, Where am I? I told her that I did not know, but wherever it might be we were safe, and that whatever she might say to me I would promise her should go no farther. Then there was a long pause. To encourage further conversation I asked her if she did not think we had been having a rather backward spring. She said we had, but she prophesied a long open fall. Then there was another pause after which I offered her a seat on an old red empty powder can. Still she seemed shy and reserved. I would make a remark to which she would reply, briefly, and then there would be a pause of a little over an hour. Still it seemed longer. Suddenly the idea of marriage presented itself to my mind. If we never got out of the shaft, of course, an engagement need not be announced. No one had ever plighted his or her troth at the bottom of a prospect shaft before. It was certainly unique, to say the least. I suggested it to her. She demurred to this on the ground that our acquaintance had been so brief, and that we had never been thrown together before. I told her that this would be no objection, and that my parents were so far away that I did not think they would make any trouble about it. She said that she did not mind her parents so much as she did the violent temper of her husband. I asked her if her husband had ever indulged in polygamy. She replied that he had, frequently. He had several previous wives. I convinced her that in the eyes of the law, and under the Edmunds bill, she was not bound to him. Still she feared the consequences of his wrath. Then. I suggested a desperate plan. We would elope. I was now thirty-seven years old, and yet had never eloped. Neither had she. So when the first streaks of rosy dawn crept across the soft autumnal sky, and touched the rich and royal coloring on the rugged sides of the grim old mountains, we got out of the shaft and eloped. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 On Cyclones I desire to state that my position as United States Cyclonist for this judicial district is now vacant. I resigned on the ninth day of September, A.D. 1884. I have not the necessary personal magnetism to look a cyclone in the eye and make it quail. I am stern and even haughty in my intercourse with men, but when a Manitoba Simoon takes me by the brow of my pantaloons and throws me across Township 28, Range 18, west of the Fifth Principal Meridian, I lose my mental reserve and become anxious and even taciturn. For thirty years I had yearned to see a grown-up cyclone of the ring-tail puller variety mop up the green earth with huge forest trees and make the landscape look tired. On the ninth day of September, A.D. 1884, my morbid curiosity was gratified. As the people came out into the forest with lanterns, and pulled me out of the crotch of a basswood tree with a tackle and fall, I remember I told them I didn't yearn for any more atmospheric phenomena. The old desire for a hurricane that would blow a cow through a penitentiary was satiated. I remember when the doctor pried the bones of my leg together in order to kind of draw my attention away from the limb. He asked me how I liked the fall style of Zephyr in that locality. I said it was all right, what there was of it. I said this in a tone of bitter irony. Cyclones are of two kinds. 
viz the dark maroon cyclone and the iron-gray cyclone with pale green mane and tail it was the latter kind i frolicked with on the above named date my brother and i were riding along in the grand old forest and i had just been singing a few bars from the opera of whoop em up lizzie jane when i noticed that the wind was beginning to sow through the trees soon after that i noticed that i was sowing through the trees also and i am really no slouch of a sour either when i get started the horse was hanging by the breeching from the bough of a large butternut tree waiting for some one to come and pick him i did not see my brother at first but after a while he disengaged himself from a rail fence and came where i was hanging wrong end up with my personal effects spilling out of my pockets i told him that as soon as the wind kind of softened down i wished he would go and pick the horse he did so and at midnight a party of friends carried me into town on a stretcher it was quite an ovation to think of a torchlight procession coming way out there into the woods at midnight and carrying me into town on their shoulders in triumph and yet i was once only a poor boy it shows what may be accomplished by any one if he will persevere and insist on living a different life the cyclone is a natural phenomenon enjoying the most robust health it may be a pleasure for a man with great will-power and an iron constitution to study more carefully into the habits of the cyclone but as far as i am concerned individually i could worry along some way if we didn't have a phenomenon in the house from one year's end to another as i sit here with my leg in a silicate of soda corset and watch the merry throng promenading down the street or mingling in the giddy torchlight procession i cannot repress a feeling toward a cyclone that almost amounts to disgust End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 Verona We arrived in Verona day before yesterday. Most everyone has heard of the two gentlemen of Verona. This is the place they came from. They have never returned. Verona is not noted for its gentlemen now. Perhaps that is the reason I was regarded as such a curiosity when I came here. Verona is a good deal older town than Chicago, but the two cities have points of resemblance after all. When the southern simoon from the stockyards is wafted across the vinegar orchards of Chicago, and a load of Mormon immigrants get out at the Rock Island depot and begin to move around and squirm and emit the fragrance of crushed Limburger cheese, it reminds one of verona the sky is similar too at night when it is raining hard the sky of chicago and verona is not dissimilar chicago is the largest place however and my sympathies are with her verona has about sixty eight thousand people now aside from myself this census includes foreigners and indians not taxed Verona has an ancient skating rink, known in history as the Amphitheater. It is four hundred and four and a half feet by five hundred and sixteen in size, and the wall is still one hundred feet high in places. The people of Verona wanted me to lecture there, but I refrained. I was afraid that some latecomers might elbow their way in and leave one end of the Amphitheater open, and then there would be a draft. I will speak more fully on the subject of amphitheaters in another letter. There is room in this one. Verona is noted for the Capitular Library, as it is called. This is said to be the largest collection of rejected manuscripts in the world. I stood in with the librarian, and he gave me an opportunity to examine this wonderful store of literary work. I found a Virgil that was certainly over sixteen hundred years old 
I also found a well-preserved copy of Beautiful Snow. I read it. It was very touching indeed. Experts said it was seventeen hundred years old, which is no doubt correct. I am no judge of the age of manuscripts. Some can look at the teeth of a literary production and tell within two weeks how old it is, but I can't. You can fool me on the age of wine. My rule used to be to observe how old I felt the next day, and to fix that as the age of the wine, but this rule I find is not infallible. One time I found myself feeling the next day as though I might be one hundred and thirty-eight years old, but on investigation we found that the wine was extremely new, having been made at a drug store in Cheyenne that same day. Looking these venerable manuscripts over, I noticed that the custom of writing with a violet pencil on both sides of the large foolscap sheet, and then folding it in sixteen directions and carrying it around in the pocket for two or three centuries, is not a late American invention, as I had been led to suppose. They did it in Italy fifteen centuries ago. I was permitted, also, to examine the celebrated institutes of Gaius. Gaius was a poor penman, and I am convinced, from a close examination of his work, that he was in the habit of carrying his manuscript around in his pocket with his smoking tobacco. The guide said that was impossible, for smoking tobacco was not introduced into Italy until a comparatively late day. That's all right, however. You can't fool me much on the odor of smoking tobacco. The churches of Verona are numerous, and although they seem to me a little different from our own in many ways, they resemble ours in others. One thing that pleased me about the churches of Verona was the total absence of the church fair and festival as conducted in America. Salvation seems to be handed out in Verona without ice cream and cake, and the odor of sanctity and stewed oysters do not go inevitably hand in hand. I have already been in the place more than two days, and I have not yet been invited to help lift the old church debt on the cathedral. Perhaps they think I am not wealthy, however, perhaps they think I am not wealthy, however. In fact, there is nothing about my dress or manner that would betray my wealth. I have been in Europe now six weeks, and have kept my secret well. Even my most intimate traveling companions do not know that I am the Laramie City Postmaster in disguise. The cathedral is a most imposing and massive pile. I quote this from the guidebook. This beautiful structure contains a baptismal font cut out of one solid block of stone, and made for immersion with an inside diameter of ten feet. A man nine feet high could be baptized there without injury. The Venetians have a great respect for water. They believe it ought not to be used for anything else but to wash away sins, and even then they are economical about it. There is a nice picture here by Titian. It looks as though it had been left in the smokehouse nine hundred years and overlooked. Titian painted a great deal. You find his works here ever and anon. He must have had all he could do in Italy in an early day when the country was new. I like his pictures first-rate, but I haven't found one yet that I could secure at anything like a bedrock price. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 A Great Upheaval I have just received the following letter, which I take the liberty of publishing, in order that good may come out of it, and that the public generally may be on the watch. Quote, William Nye, Esquire. Dear Sir, There has been a great religious upheaval here, and great anxiety on the part of our entire congregation, and I write to you, hoping that you may have some suggestions to offer that we could use at this time beneficially. All the bitter and irreverent remarks of Bob Ingersoll have fallen harmlessly upon the minds of our people, 
the flippant sneers and wicked sarcasms of the modern infidel, wise in his own conceit, have alike passed over our heads without damage or disaster. These times that have tried men's souls have only rooted us more firmly in the faith and united us more closely as brothers and sisters. We do not care whether the earth was made in two billion years or two minutes, so long as it was made and we are satisfied with it. We do not care whether Jonah swallowed the whale or the whale swallowed Jonah. None of these things worry us in the least. We do not pin our faith on such little matters as those. But we try to so live that when we pass on beyond the flood we may have a record to which we may point with pride. But last Sabbath our entire congregation was visibly moved. People who had grown gray in this church got right up during the service and went out, and did not come in again. Brothers who had heard all kind of infidelity and scorned to be moved by it got up and kicked the pews and slammed the doors and created a young riot. For many years we have sailed along in the most peaceful faith, and through joy or sorrow we came to the church together to worship. We have laughed and wept as one family for a quarter of a century, and an humble dignity and Christian style of etiquette have pervaded our incomings and our outgoings. That is the reason why a clear case of disorderly conduct in our church has attracted attention and newspaper comment. That is the reason why we want in some public way to have the church set right before we suffer from unjust criticism and worldly scorn. It has been reported that one of the brothers, who is sixty years of age and a model Christian and a good provider, rose during the first prayer and, waving his plug hat in the air, gave a wild and blood-curdling whoop, jumped over the back of his pew and lit out. While this is in a measure true, it is not accurate. He did do some wild and startling jumping, but he did not jump over the pew. He tried to, but failed. He was too old. It has also been stated that another brother who has done more to build up the church and society here than any other one man of his size, threw his hymn-book across the church, and with a loud wail that sounded like the word gosh, hissed through clenched teeth, got out through the window and went away. This is overdrawn, though there is an element of truth in it, and I do not try to deny it. There were other similar strong evidences of feelings throughout the congregation, none of which had ever been noticed before in this place. Our clergyman was amazed and horrified. He tried to ignore the action of the brethren, but when a sister who had grown old in our church and been such a model and example of rectitude that all the girls in the country were perfectly discouraged about trying to be anywhere near equal to her, when she rose with a wild snort, got up on the pew with her feet and swung her parasol in a way that indicated that she would not go home till morning, he paused and briefly wound up the services. Of course there were other little eccentricities on the part of the congregation, but these were the ones that people have talked about the most, and have done us the most damage abroad. Now my desire is that through the medium of the press you will state that this great trouble which has come upon us, by reason of which the ungodly have spoken lightly of us, was not the result of a general tendency to dissent from the statements made by our pastor, and therefore an exhibition of our disapproval of his doctrines, but that the janitor had started a light fire in the furnace, and that had revived a large nest of common streaked, hot-nosed wasps in the warm air-pipe, and when they came up through the register and united in the services, there was more or less of an ovation. Sometimes Christianity gets sluggish and comatose, but not under the above circumstances. A man may slumber on softly with his bosom gently rising and falling, and his breath coming and going through one corner of his mouth like the death-rattle of a bathtub, 
while the pastor opens out a new box of theological thunders and fills the air full of the sullen roar of sulphurous waves licking the shores of eternity and swallowing up the great multitudes of the eternally lost but when one little wasp with a red-hot revelation goes gently up the leg of that same man's pantaloons leaving large hot tracks wherever he stopped and sat down to think it over you will see a sudden awakening and a revival that will attract attention i wish that you would take this letter mr nye and write something from it in your own way for publication showing how we happened to have more zeal than usual in the church last sabbath and that it was not directly the result of the sermon which was preached on that day yours with great respect william lemmings end of chapter 13 chapter 14 in acknowledgment to the metropolitan guide publishing company new york gentlemen I received the copy of your justly celebrated Guide to Rapid Affluence, or How to Acquire Wealth Without Mental Exertion, price twenty-five cents. It is a great boon. I have now had this book sixteen weeks, and as I am wealthy enough, I return it. It is not much worn, and if you will allow me fifteen cents for it, I would be very grateful. It is not the intrinsic value of the fifteen cents that I care for so much, but I would like it as a curiosity. The book is wonderfully graphic and thorough in all its details, and I was especially pleased with its careful and useful recipe for ointments. One style of ointment spoken of and recommended by your valuable book is worthy of a place in history. I made some of it according to your formula. I tried it on a friend of mine. He wore it when he went away and has not as yet returned. I heard, incidentally, that it adhered to him. People who have examined it say that it retains its position on his person similar to a birthmark. Your cement does not have the same peculiarity. It does everything but adhere. Among other specialties it affects a singular odor. It has a fragrance that ought to be utilized in some way. Men have harnessed the lightning, and it seems to me that the day is not far distant when a man will be raised up who can control this latent power. Do you not think that possibly you have made a mistake and got your ointment and cement formula mixed? Your cement certainly smells like a corrupt administration in a warm room. Your revelations in the liquor manufacture, and how to make any mixed drink with one hand tied, is well worth the price of the book. The chapter on bar etiquette is also excellent. Very few men know how to properly enter a bar room and what to do after they arrive, how to get into a bar room without attracting attention, and how to get out without police interference are points upon which our American drunkards are lamentably ignorant. How to properly address a bartender is also a page that no student of good breeding could well omit. I was greatly surprised to read how simple the manufacture of drinks under your formula is. You construct a cocktail without liquor, and then rob intemperance of its sting. You also make all kinds of liquor without the use of alcohol, that demon under whose iron heel thousands of our sons and brothers go down to death and delirium annually. Thus you are doing a good work. You also unite aloes, tobacco, and rough-on-rats, and by a happy combination construct a style of beer that is non-intoxicating. No one could, by any possible means, become intoxicated on your justly celebrated beer. He would not have time. Before he could get inebriated, he would be in the New Jerusalem. Those who drink your beer will not fill drunkards' graves. 
they will close their career and march out of this life with perforated stomachs and a look of intense anguish. Your method of making cider without apples is also frugal and ingenious. Thousands of innocent apple-worms annually lose their lives in the manufacture of cider. They are also, in most instances, wholly unprepared to die. By your method, a style of wormless cider is constructed that would not fool anyone. It tastes a good deal like rain-water that was rained about the first time that any raining was ever done, and was deprived of air ever since. The closing chapter on the subject of How to Win the Affections of the Opposite Sex at Sixty Yards is first-rate. It is wonderful what triumph science and inventions have wrenched from obdurate conditions. Only a few years ago a young man had to work hard for weeks and months in order to win the love of a noble young woman. Now, with your valuable and scholarly work, price twenty-five cents, he studies over the closing chapter an hour or two then goes out into society and gathers in his victim. And yet I do not grudge the long, long hours I squandered in those years when people were in heathenish darkness. I had no book like yours to tell me how to win the affections of the opposite sex. I could only blunder on week after week, and yet I do not regret it. It was just the school I needed. It did me good. Your book will, no doubt, be a good thing for those who now grope. But I have groped so long that I have formed the habit and prefer it. Let me go right on groping. Those who desire to win the affections of the opposite sex at one sitting will do well to send two bits for your great work. But I am in no hurry. My time is not valuable. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 Spinal Meningitis So many people have shown a pardonable curiosity about the above-named disease, and so few have a very clear idea of the thrill of pleasure it affords the patient, unless they have enjoyed it themselves, that I have decided to briefly say something in answer to the innumerable inquiries I have received. Up to the moment I had a notion of getting some meningitis, I had never employed a physician. Since then I have been thrown in their society a great deal. Most of them were very pleasant and scholarly gentlemen, who would not soon be forgotten. But one of them doctored me first for pneumonia, then for inflammatory rheumatism, and finally, when death was contiguous, advised me that I must have change of scene and rest. I told him that if he kept on prescribing for me, I thought I might depend on both. Change of physicians, however, saved my life. This horse doctor, a few weeks afterward, administered a subcutaneous morphine squirt in the arm of a healthy servant-girl, because she had a headache and she is now with the rest of this veterinarian's patients in a land that is fairer than this. She lived six hours after she was prescribed for. He gave her change of scene and rest. He has quite a thriving little cemetery filled with people who have succeeded in cording up enough of his change of scene and rest to last them through all eternity. He was called once to prescribe for a man whose head had been caved in by a stone matchbox, and, after treating the man for asthma and blind staggers, he prescribed rest and change of scene for him too. The poor asthmatic is now breathing the extremely rarefied air of the new Jerusalem. Meningitis is derived from the Latin meninges, membrane, and itis an affect denoting inflammation, so that, strictly speaking, meningitis is the inflammation of a membrane, and when applied to the spine or cerebrum, it is called spinal meningitis, or cerebrospinal meningitis, etc. 
according to the part of the spine or brain involved in the inflammation. Meningitis is a characteristic and result of so-called spotted fever, and by many it is deemed identical with it. When we come to consider that the spinal cord or marrow runs down through the long bony shaft made by the vertebrae, and that the brain and spine, though connected, are bound up in one continuous bony wall and covered with this inflamed membrane, it is not difficult to understand that the thing is very hard to get at. If your throat gets inflamed, a doctor asks you to run your tongue out into society about a yard and a half, and he pries your mouth open with one of Roger's brother's spoon handles. Then he is able to examine your throat, as he would a page of the Congressional Record, and to treat it with some local application. When you have spinal meningitis, however, the doctor tackles you with bromides, ergots, ammonia, iodine, chlorohydrate, codi, bromide of ammonia, hashish, bismuth, valerianate of ammonia, morphine sulf, nux vomica, turpentine emulsion, vox humana, rex magnum, opium, cantharides, dover's powders, and other bric-a-brac. These remedies are masticated and acted upon by the salivary glands, passed down the esophagus, thrown into the society of old gastric, submitted to the peculiar motion of the stomach, and thoroughly chemified, then forwarded through the pyloric orifice into the smaller intestines, where they are touched up with bile, and later on handed over through the lacteals, thoracic duct, etc., to the vast circulatory system. Here it is yanked back and forth through the heart, lungs, and capillaries, and if anything is left to fork over to the disease, it has to squeeze into the long bony air tight socket that holds the spinal cord. All this is done without seeing the patient's spinal cord before or after taking. If it could be taken out and hung over a clothesline, and cleansed with benzene, and then treated with insect powder, or rolled in cornmeal, or preserved in alcohol, and then put back, it would be all right. But you can't. You pull a man's spine out of his system, and he is bound to miss it, no matter how careful you have been about it. It is difficult to keep house without the spine. You need it every time you cook a meal. If the spinal cord could be pulled by a dentist and put away in pounded ice every time it gets a hot box, spinal meningitis would lose its stinger. I was treated by thirteen physicians, whose names I will give in a future article. They were, as I said, men I shall long remember. One of them said very sensibly that meningitis was generally over-doctored. I told him that I agreed with him. I said that if I should have another year of meningitis and thirteen more doctors, I would have to postpone my trip to Europe, where I had hoped to go and cultivate my voice. I've got a perfectly lovely voice, if I could take it to Europe and have it sandpapered and varnished and mellowed down with beer and bologna. But I was speaking of my physicians. Sometime I'm going to give their biographies and portraits, as they did those of Dr. Bliss, Dr. Barnes, and others. Next year, if I can get railroad rates, I am going to hold a reunion of my physicians in Chicago. It will be a pleasant relaxation for them, and will save the lives of a large percentage of their patients. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 The Sun This luminous body is ninety-two million miles from the earth, though there have been mornings this winter when it seemed to me that it was farther than that. A railway train going at the rate of forty miles per hour would be two hundred sixty-three years going there, to say nothing of stopping for fuel or water, or stopping on side tracks to wait for freight trains to pass. 
Several years ago it was discovered that a slight error had been made in the calculations of the sun's distance from the earth, and owing to a misplaced logarithm or something of that kind, a mistake of three million miles was made in the result. People cannot be too careful in such matters. Supposing that on the strength of the information contained in the old timetable, a man should start out with only provisions sufficient to take him eighty-nine million miles, and should find that three million miles still stretched out ahead of him. He would then have to buy fresh figs of the train boy in order to sustain life. Think of buying nice fresh figs on a train that has been en route two hundred fifty years. Imagine a train boy starting out at ten years of age, and perishing at the age of sixty years with only one-fifth of his journey accomplished. Think of five train boys, one after the other, dying of old age on the way in the train at the last, pulling slowly into the depot with not a living thing on board except the worms and the nice eating apples. The sun cannot be examined through an ordinary telescope with impunity. Only one man ever tried that, and he is now wearing a glass eye that cost him nine dollars. If you examine the sun through an ordinary solar microscope, you discover that it has a curdled or mottled appearance, as though suffering from biliousness. It is also marked here and there by long streaks of light, called faculae, which look like foam flecks below a cataract. The spots on the sun vary from minute pores the size of an ordinary school district to spots one hundred thousand miles in diameter, visible to the nude eye. The center of these spots is as black as a brunette cat, and is called the umbra, so called because it resembles the umbrella. The next circle is less dark, and called the penumbra, because it so closely resembles the penumbra. There are many theories regarding these spots, but to be perfectly candid with the gentle reader, neither Professor Proctor nor myself can tell exactly what they are. If we could get a little closer, we flatter ourselves that we could speak more definitely. My own theory is they are either first open-air caucuses held by the colored people of the sun, or second they may be the dark horses in the campaign, or third they may be the spots knocked off the defeated candidate by the opposition. Frankly, however, I do not believe either of these theories to be tenable. Professor Proctor sneers at these theories also on the ground that these spots do not appear to revolve so fast as the sun. This, however, I am prepared to explain upon the theory that this might be the result of delays in the returns. However, I am free to confess that speculative science is filled with the intangible. The sun revolves upon his or her axle-tree, as the case may be, once in twenty-five to twenty-eight of our days, so that a man living there would have almost two years to pay a thirty-day note. We should so live that when we come to die we may go at once to the sun. Regarding the sun's temperature, Sir John Herschel says that it is sufficient to melt a shell of ice covering its entire surface to a depth of forty feet. I do not know whether he made this experiment personally, or hired a man to do it for him. The sun is like the star-spangled banner, as it is still there. You get up tomorrow morning just before sunrise, and look away toward the east and keep on looking in that direction, and at last you will see a fine sight, if what I've been told is true. If the sunrise is as grand as the sunset, it indeed must be one of nature's most sublime phenomena. The sun is the great source of light and heat for our earth. If the sun were to go somewhere for a few weeks for relaxation and rest, it would be a cold day for us. The moon, too, would be useless, for she is largely dependent on the sun. Animal life would soon cease, and real estate would become depressed in price. 
we owe very much of our enjoyment to the sun, and not many years ago there were a large number of people who worshipped the sun. When a man showed signs of emotional insanity, they took him up on the observatory of the temple and sacrificed him to the sun. They were a very prosperous and happy people. If the conqueror had not come among them with civilization and guns and grand juries, they would have been very happy indeed. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 The Stars There is much in the great field of astronomy that is discouraging to the savant who hasn't the time nor means to rummage around through the heavens. At times I am almost hopeless, and feel like saying to the great yearnful hungry world, Grope on forever, do not ask me for another scientific fact. Find it out yourself, hunt up your own new-laid planets, and let me have a rest. Never ask me again to sit up all night and take care of a new-born world while you lie in bed and wreck not. I get no salary for examining the trackless void night after night when I ought to be in bed. I sacrifice my health in order that the public may know at once of the presence of a red-hot comet fresh from the factory, and yet what thanks do I get? Is it surprising that every little while I contemplate withdrawing from scientific research to go and skin an eight-mule team down through the dim vistas of relentless years. Then again you take a certain style of star, which you learn from Professor Simon Newcomb, is such a distance that it takes fifty thousand years for its light to reach Boston. Now we will suppose that after looking over the large stock of new and second-hand stars, and after examining the spring catalogue and price list, I decide that one of the smaller size will do for me, and I buy it. How do I know that it was there when I bought it? Its cold and silent rays may have ceased forty-nine thousand years before I was born and the intelligence be still on the way. There is too much margin between sale and delivery. Every now and then another astronomer comes to me and says, Professor, I have discovered another new star, and intend to file it. Found it last night about a mile and a half south of the zenith, running loose. Haven't heard of anybody who has lost a star of the fifteenth magnitude, about thirteen hands high, with light mane and tail, have you? Now, how do I know that he has discovered a brand new star? How can I discover whether he is or is not playing an old threadbare star on me for a new one? We are told that there has been no perceptible growth or decay in the star business since man began to roam around through space in his mind and make figures on the barn door with red chalk showing the celestial timetable. No serious accidents have occurred in the starry heavens since I began to observe and study their habits. Not a star has waxed, not a star has waned to my knowledge. Not a planet has seasoned, cracked, or shown any of the injurious effects of our rigorous climate. Not a star has ripened prematurely or fallen off the trees. The varnish on the very oldest stars I find on close and critical examination to be in splendid condition. They will all no doubt wear as long as we need them, and wink on long after we have ceased to wink back. In 1866 there appeared suddenly in the Northern Crown a star of about third magnitude and worth at least two hundred and fifty dollars. It was generally conceded by astronomers that this was a brand new star that had never been used but upon consulting Agrilander's star catalogue and price list, it was found that this was not a new star at all, but an old faded star of the ninth magnitude, with the front breaths turned wrong side out and trimmed with moonlight along the seams. After a few days of phenomenal brightness, 
It gently ceased to draw a salary as a star of the third magnitude, and walked home with an Uncle Tom's cabin company. It is such things as this that make the life of the astronomer one of constant and discouraging toil. I have long contemplated, as I say, the advisability of retiring from this field of science and allowing others to light the northern lights, skim the Milky Way, and do other celestial chores. I would do it myself cheerfully, if my health would permit. But for years I have realized, and so has my wife, that my duties as an astronomer kept me up too much at night, and my wife is certainly right about it when she says if I insist on scanning the heavens night after night, coming home late with the cork out of my telescope, and my eyes red and swollen with these exhausting night vigils, I will be cut down in my prime. So I am liable to abandon the great labor to which I had intended to devote my life, my dazzling genius, and my princely income. I hope that other savants will spare me the pain of another refusal, for my mind is fully made up, that unless another skimmist is at once secured, the Milky Way will henceforth remain unscum. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 A Thrilling Experience I had a very thrilling experience the other evening. I had just filled an engagement in a strange city and retired to my cozy room at the hotel. The thunders of applause had died away, and the opera house had been locked up to await the arrival of an Uncle Tom's cabin company. The last loiterer had returned to his home and the lights in the palace of the pork-packer were extinguished. No sound was heard save the low, tremulous swash of the sleet outside, or the death-rattle in the throat of the bathtub. Then all was still as the bosom of a fried chicken when the spirit has departed. The swallow-tail coat hung limp and weary in the wardrobe, and the gross receipts of the evening were under my pillow. I needed sleep, for I was worn out with travel and anxiety. But the fear of being robbed kept me from repose. I know how desperate a man becomes when he yearns for another's gold. I know how cupidity drives a wicked man to mangle his victim, that he may win precarious prosperity, and how he will often take a short cut to wealth by means of murder, when, if he would enter politics, he might accomplish his purpose as surely and much more safely. And on, however, tired nature succumbed. I know I had succumbed, for the bell-boy afterward testified that he heard me do so. The gentle warmth of the steam-heated room, and the comforting assurance of duty well done and the approval of friends, at last lulled me into a gentle repose. Any one who might have looked upon me as I lay there in that innocent slumber, with the winsome mouth slightly ajar, and the playful limbs cast wildly about, while a merry smile now and then flitted across the regular features, would have said that no heart could be so hard as to harbor ill for one so guileless and so simple. I do not know what it was that caused me to wake. Some slight sound or other, no doubt, broke my slumber, and I opened my eyes wildly. The room was in semi-darkness. Hark! A slight movement in the corner, and the low, regular breathing of a human being. I was now wide awake. Possibly I have opened my eyes wider, but not without spilling them out of their sockets. Regularly came that soft, low breathing. Each time it seemed like a sigh of relief, but it did not relieve me. Evidently it was not done for that purpose. It sounded like the sigh of blessed relief, 
such as a woman might heave after she has returned from church and transferred herself from the embrace of her new Russian iron-black silk dress into a friendly wrapper. Regularly, like the rise and fall of a wave on the summer sea, it rose and fell, while my pale lambrequin of hair rose and fell fitfully with it. I know that people who read this will laugh at it, but there was nothing to laugh at. At first I feared that the sigh might be that of a woman who had entered the room through a transom in order to see me as I lay wrapped in slumber, and then carry the picture away to gladden her whole life. But no, that was hardly possible. It was cupidity that had driven some cruel villain to enter my apartments, and to crouch in the gloom till the proper moment should come in which to spring upon me, throttle me, crowd a hotel pillow into each lung, and, while I did the Desdemona act, rob me of my hard-earned wealth. Regularly still rose the soft breathing, as though the robber might be trying to suppress it. I reached gently under the pillow, and, securing the money, I put it in the pocket of my robe de nuit. Then, with great care, I pulled out a copy of Smith & Wesson's great work on How to Ventilate the Human Form. I said to myself that I would sell my life as dearly as possible, so that whoever bought it would always regret the trade. Then I opened the volume at the first chapter and addressed a thirty-eight caliber remark in the direction of the breath in the corner. When the echoes had died away, a sigh of relief welled up from the dark corner, also another sigh of relief later on. I then decided to light the gas and fight it out. You have no doubt seen a man scratch a match on the leg of his pantaloons. Perhaps you have also seen an absent-minded man undertake to do so, forgetting that his pantaloons were hanging on a chair at the other end of the room. However, I lit the gas with my left hand and kept my revolver pointed toward the dark corner where the breath was still rising and falling. People who had heard my lecture came rushing in, hoping to find that I had suicided, but they found that, instead of humoring the public in that way, I had shot the valve off the steam radiator. It is humiliating to write the foregoing myself, but I would rather do so than have the affair garbled by careless hands. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 The Wail of a Wife Ethel has written a letter to me and asked for a printed reply, leaving off the opening sentences which I would not care to have fall into the hands of my wife. Her note is about as follows. Quote, Vermont, February 28, 1885 My dear sir, Tender part of letter omitted for obvious reasons. Would it be asking too much for me to request a brief reply to one or two questions which many other married women as well as myself would like to have answered? I have been married now for five years. Today is the anniversary of my marriage. When I was single I was a teacher and supported myself in comfort. I had more pocket money and dressed fully as well, if not better, than I do now. Why should girls, who are abundantly able to earn their own livelihood, struggle to become the slave of a husband and children, and tie themselves to a man when they might be free and happy? I think too much is said by men, in a light and flippant manner, about the anxiety of young ladies to secure a home and a husband, and still they do deserve a part of it, as I feel that I do now for assuming a great burden when I was comparatively independent and comfortable. Now, will you suggest any advice that you think would benefit the yet unmarried and self-supporting girls? who are liable to make the same mistake that I did, 
and thus warn them in a manner that would be so much more universal in its range and reach so many more people than I could if I should raise my voice. Do this, and you will be gratefully remembered by Ethel. Close quote. It would indeed be a tough, tough man who could ignore thy gentle plea, Ethel, tougher by far than the pale intellectual hired man who now addresses you in this private and underhanded manner, unknown to your husband. Please destroy this letter, Ethel, as soon as you see it in print, so that it will not fall into the hands of Mr. Ethel, for if it should, I am gone. If your husband were to run across this letter in the public press, I could never look him in the eye again. You say that you had more pocket money before you were married than you have since, Ethel, and you regret your rash step. I am sorry to hear it. You also say that you wore better clothes when you were single than you do now. You are also pained over that. It seems that marriage with you has not paid any cash dividends, so that if you married Mr. Ethel as a financial venture, it was a mistake. You do not state how it has affected your husband. Perhaps he had more pocket money and better clothes before he married than he has since. Sometimes two people do well in business by themselves. But when they go into partnership they bust higher than a kite, if you will allow me the free English translation of a Roman expression which you might not fully understand if I should give it to you in the original Roman. Lots of self-supporting young ladies have married, and had to go very light on pin-money after that, and still they did not squeal as you do, Ethel. They did not marry for revenue only. They married for protection. This is a little political bon mot which I thought of myself. Some of my best jokes this spring are jokes that I thought of myself. No, Ethel, if you married expecting to be a dormant partner during the day, and then go through Mr. Ethel's pantaloons' pockets at night, and declare a dividend, of course life is full of bitter, bitter regret and disappointment. Perhaps it is also for Mr. Ethel. Anyhow, I can't help feeling a pang of sympathy for him. You do not say that he is unkind, or that he so far forgets himself as to wake you up in the morning with a harsh tone of voice and a yearling club. You do not say that he asks you for pocket money, or if so, whether you give it to him or not. Of course I want to do what is right in the solemn warning business. So I will give notice to all simple young women who are now self-supporting and happy that there is no statute requiring them to assume the burdens of wifehood and motherhood unless they prefer to do so. If they now have abundance of pin-money and new clothes, they may remain single if they wish without violating the laws of the land. This rule is also good when applied to young and self-supporting young men, who wear good clothes and have funds in their pockets. No young man, who is free, happy, and independent, need invest his money in a family or carry a colicky child twenty-seven miles and two laps in one night unless he prefers it. But those who go into it with the right spirit, Ethel, do not regret it. I would just as soon tell you, Ethel, if you will promise that it shall go no farther, that I do not wear as good clothes as I did before I was married. I don't have to. My good clothes have accomplished what I got them for. I played them for all they were worth, and since I got married the idea of wearing clothes as a vocation has not occurred to me. Please give my kind regards to Mr. Ethel and tell him that although I do not know him personally, I cannot help feeling sorry for him. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 My Lecture Abroad Having at last yielded to the entreaties of Great Britain, I have decided to make a professional farewell tour of England with my new and thrilling lecture entitled 
jerked across the Jordan, or the sudden and deserved elevation of an American citizen. I have therefore already written some of the cablegrams which will be sent to the Associated Press, in order to open the campaign in good shape in America on my return. Though I have been supplicated for some time by the people of England to come over there and thrill them with my eloquence, my thriller has been out of order lately so that I did not dare venture abroad. This lecture treats, incidentally, of the ease with which an American citizen may rise in the territories when he has a string tied around his neck with a few personal friends at the other end of the string. It also treats of the various styles of oratory peculiar to America, with specimens of American oratory that have been pressed and dried especially for this lecture. It is a good lecture, and the few straggling facts scattered along through it don't interfere with the lecture itself in any way. I shall appear in costume during the lecture. At each lecture a different costume will be worn, and the costume worn at the previous lecture will be promptly returned to the owner. Persons attending the lecture need not be identified. Polite American dude ushers will go through the audience to keep the flies away from those who wish to sleep during the lecture. Should the lecture be encored at its close, it will be repeated only once. This encore business is being overdone lately, I think. Following are some of the cablegrams I have already written. If any one has any suggestions as to change or other additional favorable criticisms, they will be gratefully received, but I wish to reserve the right, however, to do as I please about using them. London Bill Nye opened his foreign lecture engagement here last evening with a can-opener. It was found to be in good order. As soon as the doors were opened there was a mad rush for seats, during which three men were fatally injured. They insisted on remaining through the lecture, however, and adding to its horrors. Before eight o'clock five hundred people had been turned away. Mr. Nye announced that he would deliver a matinee this afternoon, but he has been petitioned by tradesmen to refrain from doing so, as it will paralyze the business interests of the city to such a degree that they offer to buy the house and allow the lecturer to cancel his engagement. London The great lecturer and contortionists, Bill Nye, last night closed his six weeks' engagement here with his famous lecture on The Rise and Fall of the American Horse Thief, with a grand benefit and ovation. The elite of London were present, many of whom have attended every evening for six weeks to hear this same lecture. Those who can afford it will follow the lecturer back to America, in order to be where they can hear this lecture almost constantly. Mr. Nye, at the beginning of the season, offered a prize to any one who should neither be absent nor tardy through the entire six weeks. After some hot discussion last evening, the prize was awarded to the janitor of the hall. Associated Press Cablegram, London Bill Nye will sail for America tomorrow in the steamship Senegambia. On his arrival in America he will at once pay off the national debt and found a large asylum for American dudes whose mothers are too old to take in washing and support their sons in affluence. End of chapter 20、Chapter 21 The Minor at Home Receiving another notice of assessment on my stock in the Aladdin mine the other day, reminded me that I was still interested in a bottomless hole that was supposed at one time to yield funds instead of absorbing them. The Aladdin claim was located in the spring of seventy-six by a syndicate of journalists, none of whom had ever been openly accused of wealth. If we had been, we could have proved an alibi. We secured a gang of miners to sink on the discovery. Consisting of a Chinaman named Hao Long. 
Hao Long spoke the Chinese language with great fluency. Being perfectly familiar with that language, and a little musty in the trans-Missouri English, he would converse with us in his own language sometimes by the hour, courteously overlooking the fact that we did not reply to him in the same tongue. He would converse in this way till he ran down, generally, and then he would refrain for a while. Finally, how long signified that he would like to draw his salary. Of course, he was ignorant of our ways, and as innocent of any knowledge of the intricate details peculiar to a mining syndicate as the child unborn. So he had gone to the president of our syndicate, and had been referred to the superintendent, and he had sent how long to the auditor, and the auditor had told him to go to the gang boss and get his time, and then proceed in the proper manner, after which, if his claim turned out to be all right, we would call a meeting of the syndicate and take early action in relation to it. By this the reader will readily see that, although we were not wealthy, we knew how to do business just the same as though we had been a wealthy corporation. How long attended one of our meetings, and at the close of the session made a few remarks. As near as I am able to recall his language, it was very much as follows. China boy, no sabi you dumb slendicate. You ali make fully me too muchy. How long no chuppy big hole in the ground ali day for health? You melican boy lady silver mine all same funny business. Me no likey slendicate. Slendicate heap gone all same wood mine. You sabi me? How long make them syndicate pay tension? You April fooly me, you makey me tired. You putty me too much on em slate. Slendicut no good. All the time stun me off China boy. You all the time chin chin. Dividend all the time he gone. Owing to a strike which then took place in our mine, we found that, in order to complete our assessment work, we must get in another crew or do the jobs ourselves. Owing to scarcity of help and a feeling of antagonism on the part of the laboring classes toward our giant enterprise, a feeling of hostility which naturally exists between labor and capital, we had to go out to the mine ourselves. We had heard of other men who had shoveled in their own mines and were afterward worth millions of dollars. So we took some bacon and other delicacies and hied us to the Aladdin. Buck, our mining expert, went down first. Then he requested us to hoist him out again. We did so. I have forgotten what his first remark was when he got out of the bucket. But that don't make any difference, for I wouldn't care to use it here anyway. It seems that how long, owing to his heathenish ignorance of our customs, and the unavoidable delay in adjusting his claim for work, labor, and services, had allowed his temper to get the best of him, and had planted a colony of American skunks in the shaft of the Aladdin. That is the reason we left the Aladdin mine, and no one jumped it. We had not done the necessary work in order to hold it, but when we went out there the following spring we found that no one had jumped it. Even the rough, coarse miner, far from civilizing influences and beyond the reach of social advantages, recognizes the fact that this little, unostentatious animal plodding along through life in its own modest way, yet wields a wonderful influence over the destinies of man. So the Aladdin mine was not disturbed that summer. We paid how long, and in the following spring, had a flattering offer for the claim, if it assayed as well as we said it would. So Buck, our expert, went out to the Aladdin with our assayer and the purchaser. The assay of the Aladdin showed up very rich indeed, far above anything that I had ever hoped for, and so we made a sale. 
But we never got the money, for when the assayer got home he casually assayed his apparatus and found that his whole outfit had been salted prior to the Aladdin assay. I do not think our expert Buck would salt an assayer's kit, but he was charged with it at this time, and he said he would rather lose his trade than have trouble over it. He would rather suffer wrong than to do wrong, he said, and so the Aladdin came back on our hands. It is not a very good mine if a man wants it as a source of revenue, but it makes a mighty good well. The water is cold and clear as crystal. If it stood in Boston instead of out there in northern Colorado, where you can't get at it more than three months in the year, it would be worth one hundred and fifty dollars. The great fault of the Aladdin mine is its poverty as a mine and its isolation as a well. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 Christopher Columbus Probably few people have been more successful in the discovering line than Christopher Columbus, living as he did in a day when a great many things were still in an undiscovered state. The horizon was filled with golden opportunities for a man possessed of Mr. C.'s pluck and ambition. His life at first was filled with rebuffs and disappointments, but at last he grew to be a man of importance in his own profession, and the people who wanted anything discovered would always bring it to him rather than take it elsewhere. And yet the life of Columbus was a stormy one. Though he discovered a continent wherein a millionaire attracts no attention, he himself was very poor. Though he rescued from barbarism a broad and beautiful land in whose metropolis the theft of less than half a million dollars is regarded as petty larceny, Chris himself often went to bed hungry. Is it not singular that the gray-eyed and gentle Columbus should have added a hemisphere to the history of our globe, a hemisphere, too, where pie is a common thing not only on Sunday, but throughout the week, and yet that he should have gone down to his grave pilus? Such is the history of progress in all ages and in all lines of thought and investigation. Such is the meager reward of the pioneer in new fields of action. I presume that America today has a larger pie area than any other land in which the Cockney English language is spoken. Right here, where millions of native-born Americans dwell, many of whom are ashamed of the fact that they were born here, and which shame is entirely mutual between the goddess of liberty and themselves, we have a style of pie that no other land can boast of. From the bleak and acid dried apple pie of Maine to the irrigated mince pie of the blue Pacific, all along down the long line of igneous, volcanic, and stratified pie, America, the land of the freedom bird with the highest instep in his nose, leads the world. Other lands may point with undissembled pride to their polygamy and their cholera, but we reck not. Our polygamy here is still in its infancy, and our leprosy has had the disadvantage of a cold backward spring. But look at our pie! Throughout a long and disastrous war, sometimes referred to as a fratricidal war, during which this fair land was drenched in blood, and also during which aforesaid war numerous frightful blunders were made which are fast coming to the surface, through the courtesy of participants in said war, who have patiently waited for those who blundered to die off, and now admit that said participants who are dead did blunder exceedingly throughout all this long and deadly struggle for the supremacy of liberty and right, as I was about to say when my mind began to wobble, the American pie has shone forth resplendent in the full glare of a noonday sun, 
or beneath the pale green of the electric light, and she stands forth proudly today with her undying loyalty to dyspepsia untrammeled and her deep and deadly gastric antipathy still fiercely burning in her breast. That is the proud history of American Pie. Powers, principalities, kingdoms, and handmade dynasties may crumble, but the republican form of pie does not crumble. Tyranny may totter on its throne, but the American pie does not totter, not a tot. No foreign threat has ever been able to make our common chicken pie quail. I do not say this because it is smart. I simply say it to fill up. But would it not do Columbus good to come among us today and look over our free institutions? Would it not please him to ride over this continent which has been rescued by his presence of mind from the thraldom of barbarism and forked over to the genial and refining influences of prohibition and pie? America fills no mean niche in the great history of nations. And if you listen carefully for a few moments, you will hear some American, with his mouth full of pie, make that remark. The American is always frank and perfectly free to state that no other country can approach this one. We allow no little two-for-a-quarter monarchy to excel us in the size of our failures, or in the calm and self-poised deliberation with which we erect a monument to the glory of a worthy citizen who is dead, and therefore politically useless. The careless student of the career of Columbus will find much in these lines that he has not yet seen. He will realize, when he comes to read this little sketch, the pains and the trouble and the research necessary before such an article on the life and work of Columbus could be written, and he will thank me for it, but it is not for that that I have done it. It is a pleasure for me to hunt up and arrange historical and biographical data in a pleasing form for the student and savant. I am only too glad to please and gratify the student and the savant. I was that way myself once, and I know how to sympathize with him. P.S. I neglected to state that Columbus was a married man. Still, he did not murmur or repine. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 The Amateur Carpenter In my opinion, every professional man should keep a chest of carpenter's tools in his barn or shop and busy himself at odd hours with them in constructing the varied articles that are always needed about the house. There is a great deal of pleasure in feeling your own independence of other trades, and more especially of the carpenter. Every now and then your wife will want a bracket put up in some corner or other, and, with your new bright saw and glittering hammer, you can put up one upon which she can hang a cast-iron horse-blanket lambrequin with inflexible water-lilies sewed in it. A man will, if he tries, readily learn to do a great many such little things, and his wife will brag on him to the other ladies, and they will make invidious comparisons between their husbands, who can't do anything of that kind whatever, and you, who are so handy. Firstly, you buy a set of amateur carpenter tools. You do not need to say that you are an amateur. The dealer will find that out when you ask him for an easy-running broad axe or a green-gauge plumb line. He will sell you a set of amateur's tools that will be made of old sheet iron with basswood handles, and the saws will double up like a piece of stovepipe. After you have nailed a board on the fence successfully, you will very naturally desire to do something much better, more difficult. You will probably try to erect a parlor table or rustic settee. I made a very handsome bracket last week, and I was naturally proud of it. 
in fastening it together, if I hadn't inadvertently nailed it to the barn floor, I guess I could have used it very well, but in tearing it loose from the barn so that the two could be used separately, I ruined a bracket that was intended to serve as the base, as it were, of a lambrequin, which cost nine dollars, aside from the time expended on it. During the month of March I built an ice chest for this summer. It was not handsome, but it was roomy, and would be very nice for the season of 1886, I thought. It worked pretty well through March and April, but as the weather begins to warm up that ice chest is about the warmest place around the house. There is actually a glow of heat around that ice chest that I didn't notice elsewhere. I've shown it to several personal friends. They seem to think it is not built tightly enough for an ice chest. My brother looked at it yesterday and said that his idea of an ice chest was that it ought to be tight enough at least to hold the larger chunks of ice so that they would not escape through the pores of the ice box. He says he never built one, but that it stood to reason that a refrigerator like that ought to be constructed so that it would keep the cows out of it. You don't want to have a refrigerator that the cattle can get through the cracks of and eat up your strawberries on ice, he says. A neighbor of mine, who once built a hen resort of laths, and now wears a thick thumbnail that looks like a Brazil nut as a memento of that pullet corral, says my ice chest is all right enough, only that it is not suited to this climate. He thinks that a long burying straight, during the holidays, my ice chest would work like a charm. And even here, he thought, if I could keep the fever out of my chest there would be less pain. I have made several other little articles of vertu this spring, to the construction of which I have contributed a good deal of time and two fingernails. I have also sawed into my leg two or three times. The leg, of course, will get well, but the pantaloons will not. Parties wishing to meet me in my studio during the morning hour will turn into the alley between 8th and Ninth Streets, enter the third stable door on the left, pass around behind my Gothic horse, and give the countersign and three kicks on the door in an ordinary tone of voice. End of chapter 23「Chapter Twenty Four: The Average Hen I am convinced that there is great economy in keeping hens if we have sufficient room for them and a thorough knowledge of how to manage the fowl property. But to the professional man, who is not familiar with the habits of the hen, and whose mind does not naturally and instinctively turn henward, I would say, Shun her as you would the deadly upas tree of Piscataquis County, me. Nature has endowed the hen with but a limited amount of brain force. Any one will notice that if he will compare the skull of the average self-made hen with that of Daniel Webster, taking careful measurements directly over the top from one ear to the other, the well-informed brain student will at once notice a great falling off in the region of reverence and an abnormal bulging out in the location of alimentiveness. Now take your tape measure, and, beginning at memory, pass carefully over the occipital bone to the base of the brain in the region of love of home and offspring, and you will see that, while the hen suffers much in comparison with the statement in the relative size of sublimity, reflection, spirituality, time, tune, etc., when it comes to love of home and offspring, she shines forth with great splendor. The hen does not care for the sublime in nature, neither does she care for music. Music hath no charms to soften her tough old breast but she loves her home and her country. I have sought to promote the interest of the hen to some extent, but I have not been a marked success in that line. I can write a poem in fifteen minutes. 
I always could dash off a poem whenever I wanted to, and a very good poem, too, for a dashed poem. I could write a speech for a friend in Congress, a speech that would be printed in the Congressional Record and go all over the United States and be read by no one. I could enter the field of letters anywhere and attract attention, but when it comes to setting a hen, I feel that I am not worthy. I never feel my utter unworthiness as I do in the presence of a setting hen. When the adult hen in my presence expresses a desire to set, I excuse myself and go away. That is the supreme moment when a hen desires to be alone. That is no time for me to introduce my shallow levity. I never do, and it is after death that I most fully appreciate the hen. When she has been cut down early in life and fried, I respect her. No one can look upon the still features of a young hen, overtaken by death in life's young morning, snuffed out, as it were, like an old tin lantern in a gale of wind, without being visibly affected. But it is not the hen who desires to set for the purpose of getting out an early edition of spring chickens that I am averse to. It is the aged hen who is in her dotage, and whose eggs also are in their second childhood. Upon this hen I shower my anathemas. Overlooked by the pruning hook of time, shallow in her remarks, and a wallflower in society, she deposits her quota of eggs in the catnip conservatory far from the haunts of men, and then in August, when eggs are extremely low and her collection of no value to any one but the antiquarian, she proudly calls attention to her summer's work. This hen does not win the general confidence. Shunned by a good society during life, her death is only regretted by those who are called upon to assist at her obsequies. Selfish through life, her death is regarded as a calamity by those alone who are expected to eat her. And what has such a hen to look back upon in her closing hours? A long life, perhaps, for longevity is one of the characteristics of this class of hens. But of what has that life been productive? How many golden hours has she frittered away, hovering over a porcelain doorknob trying to hatch out a litter of Queen Anne cottages? How many nights has she passed in solitude on her lonely nest, with a heart filled with bitterness toward all mankind, hoping against hope that in the fall she would come off the nest with a cunning little brick block, perhaps? Such is the history of the aimless hen. While others were at work, she stood around with her hands in her pockets and criticized the policy of those who labored, and when the summer waned, she came forth with nothing but regret to wander listlessly about and freeze off some more of her feet during the winter. For such a hen, death can have no terrors. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 My Experience as an Agriculturist During the past season I was considerably interested in agriculture. I met with some success, but not enough to madden me with joy. It takes a good deal of success to unscrew my reason and make it totter on its throne. I've had trouble with my liver and various other abnormal conditions of the vital organs, but old reason sits there on his or her throne, as the case may be, through it all. Agriculture has a charm about it which I cannot adequately describe. Every product of the farm is furnished by nature with something that loves it, so that it will never be neglected. The grain crop is loved by the weevil, the hessian fly, and the chinch bug. The watermelon, the squash, and the cucumber are loved by the squash bug. 
The potato is loved by the potato bug. The sweet corn is loved by the ant, thou sluggard. The tomato is loved by the cutworm. The plum is loved by the curculio, and so forth and so forth so that no plant that grows need be a wallflower. Early blooming and extremely dwarf joke for the table, plant as soon as there is no danger of frosts, in drills four inches apart. When ripe, pull it and eat raw with vinegar. The red ants may be added to taste. Well, I began early to spade up my angleworms and other pets, to see if they had withstood the severe winter. I found they had. They were unusually bright and cheerful. The potato bugs were a little sluggish at first, but as the spring opened and the ground warmed up, they pitched right in and did first rate. Every one of my bugs in May looked splendidly. I was most worried about my cutworms. Away along in April I had not seen a cutworm, and I began to fear they had suffered, and perhaps perished, in the extreme cold of the previous winter. One morning, late in the month, however, I saw a cutworm come out from behind a cabbage stump and take off his earmuff. He was a little stiff in the joints, but he had not lost hope. I saw at once now was the time to assist him if I had a spark of humanity left. I searched every work I could find on agriculture to find out what it was that farmers fed their blamed cutworms, but all scientists seemed to be silent. I read the agricultural reports, the dictionary, and the encyclopedia, but they didn't throw any light on the subject. I got wild. I feared that I had brought but one cutworm through the winter, and I was liable to lose him unless I could find out what to feed him. I asked some of my neighbors, but they spoke jeeringly and sarcastically. I know now how it was. All their cutworms had frozen down last winter, and they couldn't bear to see me get ahead. All at once an idea struck me. I haven't recovered from the concussion yet. It was this. The worm had wintered under a cabbage stalk. No doubt he was fond of the beverage. I acted upon this thought and bought him two dozen red cabbage plants at fifty cents a dozen. I had hit it the first pop. He was passionately fond of these plants, and would eat three in one night. He also had several matinees and sauerkraut lawn festivals for his friends, and in a week I bought three dozen more cabbage plants. By this time I had collected a large group of common scrub cutworms, early Swedish cutworms, dwarf Hubbard cutworms, and short horn cutworms, all doing well. But still, I thought, a little hidebound and bilious, they acted languid and listless. As my squash bugs, currant worms, potato bugs, etc., were all doing well without care, I devoted myself almost exclusively to my cutworms. They were all strong and well, but they seemed melancholy with nothing to eat day after day but cabbages. I therefore bought five dozen tomato plants that were tender and large. These I fed to the cutworms at the rate of eight or ten in one night. In a week the cutworms had thrown off that air of ennui and languor that I had formerly noticed, and were gay and light-hearted. I got them some more tomato plants, and then some more cabbage for change. On the whole I was as proud as any young farmer who has made a success of anything. One morning I noticed that a cabbage plant was left standing unchanged. The next day it was still there. I was thunderstruck. I dug into the ground. My cutworms were gone. I spaded up the whole patch, but there wasn't one. Just as I had become attached to them, and they had learned to look forward each day to my coming, when they would almost always come up and eat a tomato plant out of my hand, someone had robbed me of them. I was almost wild with despair and grief. Suddenly something tumbled over my foot. It was mostly stomach, but it had feet on each corner. 
A neighbor said it was a warty toad. He had eaten up my summer's work. He had swallowed my cunning little cutworms. I tell you, gentle reader, unless some way is provided whereby this warty toad scourge can be wiped out, I, for one, shall relinquish the joys of agricultural pursuits. When a common toad with a sallow complexion and no intellect can swallow up my summer's work, it is time to pause. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Done It a Purpose at Greeley, a young man with a faded cardigan jacket and a look of woe got on the train, and as the car was a little crowded, he sat in the seat with me. He had that troubled and anxious expression that a rural young man wears when he first rides on the train. When the engine whistled, he would almost jump out of that cardigan jacket, and then he would look kind of foolish, like a man who allows his impulses to get the best of him. Most everyone noticed the young man and his cardigan jacket, for the latter had arrived at the stage of droopiness and jaded across the shoulders look that the cheap knit jacket of commerce acquires after a while, and it had shrunken behind and stretched out in front so that the horizon, as you stood behind the young man, seemed to be bound by the tail of his garment, which started out at the pocket with good intentions and suddenly decided to rise above the young man's shoulder-blades. He seemed so diffident and so frightened among strangers that I began to talk with him. "'Do you live at Greeley?' I inquired. "'No, sir,' he said in an embarrassed way, as most anyone might in the presence of greatness. "'I live on a ranch up the pandry. I was just at Greeley to see the circus.' I thought I would play the tenderfoot and inquiring pilgrim from the cultured East, so I said, You do not see the circus often in the West, I presume? The distance is so great between towns, and the cost of transportation is so great? No, sir. This is the first circus I ever was to. I have never seen a circus before. How did you like it? Oh, tip-top. It was a good thing. I'd like to see it every day if I could. I laughed and drank lemonade till I've got my clothes all pinned up with pins, and I'd as soon tell you, if you won't give it away, that my pants is tied on me with barbed fence wire. Probably that's what gives you that anxious and apprehensive look? Yes, sir. If I look kind of doubtless about something, it's because I'm afraid my pantaloons will fall off on the floor and I will have to borrow a roller towel to wear home. How did you like the animals? I like that part of the great moral aggregation the best of all. I have not saw such a sight before. I could stand there and watch that there old scaly elephant stuff hay into his bosom with his long rubber nose for hours. I'd read a good deal first and last about the elephant, the king of beasts, but I had never yet saw one. Yesterday father told me there hadn't been much joy into my young life, and so he gave me a dollar and told me to go over to the circus and have a grand time. I tell you, I just turned myself loose and gave myself up to pleasure. What other animals seem to please you? I asked, seeing that he was getting a little freer to talk. Oh, I saw the blue-nosed baboon from farther India and the red-eyed sand-hill crane from Madagascar, I think it was, and the scared jack-rabbit from Scandinavia, and the lop-eared lammy from South America. Then there was the female acrobat, with her hair tied up with a red ribbon. It's funny about them acrobat women. They get big pay, but they never buy clothes with their money. Now the idea of a woman that gets two or three dollars a day, for all I know, coming out there before two thousand total strangers, wearing a pair of Indian war clubs and a red ribbon in her hair. I tell you, partner, them acrobat prima donners are mighty stingy with their money, or else they're mighty economical with their clothes. Did you go into the sideshow? No, sir. I studied the oil paintings on the outside, but I didn't go in. I met a handsome-looking man there near the sideshow, though, that seemed to take an interest in me. 
There was a lottery along with the show, and he wanted me to go and throw for him. Capper, probably? Probably so. Uh, anyhow, he gave me a dollar and told me to go and throw for him. Why didn't he throw for himself? Oh, he said the lottery man knew him and wouldn't let him throw. Of course, same old story. He saw you were a greenie and got you to throw for him. He stood in with the game so that you drew a big prize for the capper, created a big excitement, and you and the crowd sailed in and lost all the money you had. I'll bet he was a man with a velvet coat and a mustache dyed a dead black and waxed as sharp as a cambric needle. Yes, that's his description to a dot. I wonder if he really did do that a purpose. Well, tell us about it. It does me good to hear a blame fool tell how he lost his money. Don't you see that your awkward ways and general greenness struck the capper the first thing? And you not only threw away your own money, but two or three hundred other whoppy-jawed pelicans saw you draw a big prize and thought it was yours. Then they deposited what little they had, and everything was lovely. Well, I'll tell you how it was, if it'll do any good and save other young men in the future. You see, this capper, as you call him, gave me a one-dollar bill to throw for him, and I put it into my vest pocket so, along with the dollar bill father gave me. I always carry my money in my right-hand vest pocket. Well, I sailed up to the game, big as old Jumbo himself, and put a dollar into the game. As you say, I drawed a big prize, twenty dollars and a silver cup. The man offered me five dollars for the cup, and I took it. Then it flashed over my mind that I might have gotten my dollar and the other fellows mixed. So I says to the proprietor, I will now invest a dollar for a gent who asked me to draw for him. Thereupon I took out the other dollar, and I'll be eternally chastened if I didn't draw a brass locket worth about two bits a bushel. I didn't say anything for a long time. Then I asked him how the capper acted when he got his brass locket. Well, he seemed pained and grieved about something, and he asked me if I hadn't time to go away into a quiet place where we could talk it over by ourselves. But he had kind of a cruel, insincere look in his eye, and I said no. I believed I didn't care to, and that I was a poor conversationalist anyhow. And so I came away and left him looking at his brass locket and kicking holes in the ground and using profane language. Afterward I saw him talking to the proprietor of the lottery, and I feel somehow that they had lost confidence in me. I heard them speak of me in a jeering tone of voice, and one said as I passed by, There goes the meek-eyed rural convict now, and he used a horrid oath at the same time. If it hadn't been for that one little coincidence, there would have been nothing to mar the enjoyment of the occasion. End of chapter 26「Chapter Twenty Seven, Mush and Melody Lately I have been giving a good deal of attention to hygiene in other people. The gentle reader will notice that, as a rule, the man who gives the most time and thought to this subject is an invalid himself, just as the young theological student devotes his first sermon to the care of children and the ward politician talks the smoothest on the subject of how and when to plant rutabagas or wean a calf from the parent stem. Having been thrown into the society of physicians a great deal the past two years, mostly in the role of patient, I have given some study to the human form, its structure and idiosyncrasies, as it were. Perhaps few men in the same length of time have successfully acquired a larger or more select repertoire of choice diseases than I have. I do not say this boastfully. I simply desire to call the attention of our growing youth to the glorious possibilities that await the ambitious and enterprising in this line. Starting out as a poor boy, with few advantages in the way of disease, I have resolutely carved my way up to the dizzy heights of fame as a chronic invalid and drug-soaked relic of other days. 
I inherited no disease whatever. My ancestors were poor and healthy. They bequeathed me no snug little nucleus of fashionable malaria such as other boys had. I was obliged to acquire it myself. Yet I was not discouraged. The results have shown that disease is not alone the heritage of the wealthy and the great. The poorest of us may become eminent invalids if we will only go at it in the right way. But I started out to say something on the subject of health, for there are still many common people who would rather be healthy and unknown than obtain distinction with some dazzling new disease. Noticing many years ago that imperfect mastication and dyspepsia walked hand in hand, so to speak, Mr. Gladstone adopted in his family a regular mastication scale. For instance, thirty-two bites for steak, twenty-two for fish, and so forth. Now I take this idea and improve upon it. Two statesmen can always act better in concert if they will do so. With Mr. Gladstone's knowledge of the laws of health and my own musical genius, I have hit on a way to make eating not only a duty but a pleasure. Eating is too frequently irksome. There is nothing about it to make it attractive. What we need is a union of mush and melody, if I may be allowed that expression. Mr. Gladstone has given us the graduated scale so that we know just what meter a bill of fare goes in as quick as we look at it. In this way the day is not far distant when music and mastication will march down through the dim vista of years together. The baked bean chant, the vermicelli waltz, the mush and milk march, the sad and touchful pumpkin pie refrain, the gay and rollicking oxtail soup gallop, and the melting ice-cream serenade will yet be common musical names. Taking different classes of food, I have set them to music in such a way that the meal, for instance, may open with a soup overture, to be followed by a roast beef march in C, and so on, closing with a kind of mince pie la sonambula pianissimo in G. Space, of course, forbids an extended description of this idea, as I propose to carry it out. But the conception is certainly grand. Let us picture the jaws of a whole family, moving in exact time to a Strauss waltz on the silent remains of the late lamented hen, and we see at once how much real pleasure may be added to the process of mastication. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 History of Babylon The history of Babylon is fraught with sadness. It illustrates only too painfully that the people of a town make or mar its success rather than the natural resources and advantages it may possess on the start. Thus Babylon, with three thousand years the start of Minneapolis, is today a hole in the ground, while Minneapolis socks her XXXX flower into every corner of the globe, and the price of real estate would make a common dynasty totter on its throne. Babylon is a good illustration of the decay of a town that does not keep up with the procession. Compare her today with Kansas City. While Babylon was the capital of Chaldea, 1,270 years before the birth of Christ, and Kansas City was organized so many years after that event that many of the people there have forgotten all about it, Kansas City has doubled her population in ten years, while Babylon is simply a Gothic hole in the ground. Why did trade and emigration turn their backs upon Babylon and seek out Minneapolis, St. Paul, Kansas City, and Omaha? Was it because they were blessed with a bluer sky or a more genial sun? Not by any means. While Babylon lived upon what she had been and neglected to advertise, 
Other towns, with no history extending back into the moldy past, whooped with an exceeding great whoop and tore up the ground and shed printer's ink and showed marked signs of vitality. That is the reason that Babylon is no more. This life of ours is one of intense activity. We cannot rest long in idleness without inviting forgetfulness, death, and oblivion. Quote, Babylon was probably the largest and most magnificent city of the ancient world. Close quote. Isaiah, who lived about three hundred years before Herodotus, and whose remarks are unusually free from local or political prejudice, refers to Babylon as quote, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Caldric's excellency. Close quote. And yet, while Cheyenne has the electric light and two daily papers, Babylon hasn't got so much as a skating rink. A city, fourteen miles square, with a brick wall around it three hundred and fifty-five feet high, she has quietly forgotten to advertise, and she in turn also is forgotten. Babylon was remarkable for the two beautiful palaces, one on each side of the river, and the great temple of Belus. Connected with one of these palaces was the Hanging Garden, regarded by the Greeks as one of the seven wonders of the world, but that was prior to the erection of the Washington Monument and civil service reform. This was a square of four hundred Greek feet on each side. The Greek foot was not so long as the modern foot introduced by Miss Mills of Ohio. This garden was supported on several tiers of open arches, built one over the other, like the walls of a classic theatre, and sustaining at each stage or story a solid platform from which the arches of the next story sprung. This structure was also supported by the Common Council of Babylon, who came forward with the city funds and helped to sustain the immense weight. It is presumed that Nebuchadnezzar erected this garden before his mind became affected. The Tower of Belus, supposed by historians with a good memory to have been six hundred feet high, as there is still a red chalk mark in the sky where the top came, was a great thing in its way. I am glad I was not contiguous to it when it fell, and also that I had omitted being born prior to that time. When we turn from this picture of the past, says the historian Rawlingson, referring to the beauties of Babylon, to contemplate the present condition of these localities, we are at first struck with astonishment at the small traces which remain of so vast and wonderful a metropolis. The broad walls of Babylon are utterly broken down. God has struck it with the basam of destruction. One cannot help wondering why the use of the basam should have been abandoned. As we gaze upon the former site of Babylon, we are forced to admit that the new basam sweeps clean. On its old site no crumbling arches or broken columns are found to indicate her former beauty. Here and there huge heaps of debris alone indicate that here godless wealth and wicked selfish indolent enervating ephemeral pomp rose and defied the supreme laws to which the bloated selfish millionaire and the hard-handed hungry laborer alike must bow and they are dust to-day babylon has fallen i do not say this in a sensational way or to depreciate the value of real estate there but from actual observation, and after a full investigation, I assent without fear of successful contradiction that Babylon has seen her best days. Her boomlet is busted, and, to use a political phrase, her oriental hide is on the Chaldean fence. Such is life. We enter upon it reluctantly. We wade through it doubtfully, and die at last timidly. How we Americans do blow about what we can do before breakfast, and yet, even in our own brief history, 
how we have demonstrated what a little thing the common two-legged man is. He rises up rapidly to acquire much wealth, and if he delays about going to Canada he goes to Sing Sing, and we forget about him. There are a lot of modern Babylonians in New York City today, and if it were my business I would call their attention to it. The assertion that gold will procure all things has been so common and so popular that too many consider first the bank account, and after that honor, home, religion, humanity, and common decency. Even some of the churches have fallen into the notion that first comes the tall church, then the debt and mortgage, the ice-cream sociable, and the kingdom of heaven. Cash and Christianity go hand in hand sometimes, but Christianity ought not to confer respectability on anybody who comes into the church to purchase it. I often think of the closing appeal of the old preacher, who was more earnest than refined, perhaps, and in winding up his brief sermon on the Christian life said, A man may lose all his wealth and get poor and hungry and still recover. He may lose his health and come down close to the dark stream and still get well again. But when he loses his immortal soul, it is good-bye, John. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 The Bite of a Mad Dog A family physician, published in 1883, says for the bite of a mad dog, quote, Take ash-colored ground liverwort, cleaned, dried, and powdered half an ounce, of black pepper powdered a quarter of an ounce. Mix these well together and divide the powder into four doses one of which must be taken every morning fasting for four mornings successively in half an English pint of cow's milk warm. After these four doses are taken, the patient must go into the cold bath or a cold spring or river every morning fasting for a month. He must be dipped all over, but not stay in, with his head above water, longer than half a minute if the water is very cold. After this, he must go in three times a week for a fortnight longer. He must be bled before he begins to take the medicine." Close quote. It is very difficult to know just what is best to do when a person is bitten by a mad dog, but my own advice would be to kill the dog. After that, feel of the leg where bitten and ascertain how serious the injury has been. Then go home and put on another pair of pantaloons, throwing away those that have been lacerated. Parties having but one pair of pantaloons will have to sequester themselves or excite remarks. Then take a cold bath, as suggested above, but do not remain in the bath with the head above water more than half an hour. If the head is under water, you may remain in the bath until the funeral, if you think best. When going into the bath, it would be well to take something in your pocket to bite, in case the desire to bite something should overcome you. Some use a common shingle-nail for this purpose, while others prefer a personal friend. In any event, do not bite a total stranger on an empty stomach. It might make you ill. Never catch a dog by the tail if he has hydrophobia. Although that end of the dog is considered the most safe, you never know when a mad dog may reverse himself. If you meet a mad dog on the street, do not stop and try to quell him with a glance of the eye. Many have tried to do that, and it took several days to separate the two and tell which was mad dog and which was queller. The real hydrophobia dog generally ignores kindness and devotes himself mostly to the introduction of his justly celebrated virus. A good thing to do on observing the approach of a mad dog is to flee, and remain fled, until he has disappeared. Hunting mad dogs in a crowded street is great sport. A young man with a new revolver shooting at a mad dog is a fine sight. 
He may not kill the dog, but he might shoot into a covey of little children and possibly get one. It would be a good plan to have a balloon inflated and tied in the back yard during the season in which mad dogs mature, and get into it on the approach of the infuriated animal, get into the balloon, I mean, not the dog. This plan would not work well, however, in case a cyclone should come at the same time. When we consider all the uncertainties of life and the danger from hydrophobia, cyclones, and breach of promise, it seems sometimes as though the penitentiary was the only place where a man could be absolutely free from anxiety. If you discover that your dog has hydrophobia, it is absolutely foolish to try to cure him of the disease. The best plan is to trade him off at once for anything you can get. Do not stop to haggle over the price, but close him right out below cost. Do not tie a tin can to the tail of a mad dog. It only irritates him, and he might resent it before you get the can tied on. A friend of mine, who was a practical joker, once sought to tie a tin can to the tail of a mad dog on an empty stomach. His widow still points with pride to the marks of his teeth on the piano. If mad dogs would confine themselves exclusively to practical jokers, I would be glad to endow a home for indigent mad dogs out of my own private funds. End of chapter 29「Chapter thirty about geology geology is that branch of natural science which treats of the structure of the earth's crust and the mode of formation of its rocks it is a pleasant and profitable study and to the man who has married rich and does not need to work the amusement of busting geology with the bible or busting the bible with geology is indeed a great boon. Geology goes hand in hand with zoology, botany, physical geography, and other kindred sciences. Taxidermy, chiropody, and theology are not kindred sciences. Geologists ascertain the age of the earth by looking at its teeth and counting the wrinkles on its horns. They have learned that the earth is not only of great age, but that it is still adding to its age from year to year. It is hard to say very much of a great science in so short an article, and that is one great obstacle which I am constantly running against as a scientist. I once prepared a paper in astronomy entitled The Chronological History and Habits of the Spheres. It was very exhaustive and weighed four pounds. I sent it to a scientific publication that was supposed to be working for the advancement of our race. The editor did not print it, but he wrote me a crisp and saucy postal card, requesting me to call with a dray and remove my stuff before the Board of Health got after it. In five short years from that time he was a corpse. As I write these lines, I learn with ill-conceived pleasure that he is still a corpse. An awful dispensation of providence in the shape of a large wilted cucumber laid hold upon his vitals and cursed him with an inward pain. He has since had the opportunity, by actual personal observation, to see whether the statements by me relating to astronomy were true. His last words were, Friends, Romans, and countrymen, Beware of the cucumber. It will double you up. It was not original, but it was good. The four great primary periods of the Earth's history are as follows, viz. to wit. 1. The Eozoic, or Dawn of Life. 2. The Paleozoic, or Period of Ancient Life. 3. The Mesozoic, or Middle Period of Life. 4. The Neozoic, or Recent Period of Life. These are all subdivided again, and other words, more difficult to spell, are introduced into science, thus crowding out the vulgar herd who cannot afford to use the high-priced terms in constant conversation. Old-timers state that the primitive condition of the earth was extremely damp. 
With the onward march of time, and after the lapse of millions of years, men found that they could get along with less and less water, until at last we see the pleasant, blissful state of things. Aside from the use of water at our summer resorts, that fluid is getting to be less and less popular, and even here at these resorts it is generally flavored with some foreign substance. The earth's crust is variously estimated in the matter of thickness. Some think it is 2,500 miles thick, which would make it safe to run heavy trains across the earth anywhere on top of a second mortgage, while other scientists say that if we go down one-tenth of that distance, we will reach a place where the worm dieth not. I do not wish to express an opinion as to the actual depth or thickness of the earth's crust but I believe that it is none too thick to suit me. Thickness in the earth's crust is a mighty good fault. We estimate the age of certain strata of the earth's formation by means of a union of our knowledge of plant and animal life, coupled with our geological research and a good memory. The older scientists in the field of geology do not rely solely upon the tracks of the Hadrosaurus or the Cornucopia for their data. They simply use these things to refresh their memory. I wish I had time and space to describe some of the beautiful bacteria and gigantic worms that formerly inhabited the earth. Such an aggregation of actual living Silurian monsters, any one of which would make a man a fortune today, if it could be kept on ice and exhibited for one season only, you could take a full-grown mastodon today and with no calliope, no lithographs, no bearded lady, no clown with four pillows in his pantaloons, and no iron-jawed woman, you could go across this continent and successfully compete with the skating rink. There would be but one difficulty. Tour expenses would not be heavy. The mastodon would be willing to board around, and no one would feel like turning a mastodon out of doors if he seemed to be hungry but he might get away from you and frolic away so far in one night that you couldn't get him for a day or two even if you sent a detective for him if i had a mastodon i would rather take him when he was young and then i could make a pet of him so that he would come and eat out of my hand without taking the hand off at the same time a large mastodon weighing a hundred tons or so is awkward too I suppose that nothing is more painful than to be stepped on by an adult mastodon. I hope at some future time to write a paper for the Academy of Science on the subject of deceased fauna, fossiliferous debris, and extinct jokes, showing how, when, and why these early forms of animal life came to be extinct. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 Nero Nero, who was a Roman emperor from 54 to 68 A.D., was said to have been one of the most disagreeable monarchs to meet that Rome ever had. He was a nephew of Caligula, the emperor on his mother's side, and a son of Dominitius Ahenobarbus of St. Lawrence County. The above was really Nero's name. But in the year 50 A.D. his mother married Claudius, and her son adopted the name of Nero Claudius Drusus Germanicus. This name he was in the habit of wearing during the cold weather, buttoned up in front. During the hot weather Nero was all the name he wore. In 53 Nero married Octavia, daughter of Claudius, and went right to housekeeping. Nero and Octavia did not get along first-rate. Nero soon wearied of his young wife and finally transferred her to the new Jerusalem. In 54 Nero's mother, by concealing the rightful heir to the throne for several weeks and doctoring their returns, succeeded in getting the steady job of emperor for Nero at a good salary. His reign was quite stormy and several long bloody wars were carried on during that period. He was a good, vicarious fighter, and could successfully hold a man's coat all day while the man went to the front to get killed. 
He loved to go out riding over the battlefields, as soon as it was safe, in his gorgeously bedizened band chariot, and he didn't care if the wheels rolled in gore up to the hub, providing it was some other man's gore. It gave him great pleasure to drive about over the field of carnage and gloat over the dead. Nero was not a great success as an emperor, but as a gloater he had no rival in history. Nero's reign was characterized also by the great conflagration and Roman fireworks of July 64, on which two-thirds of the city of Rome was destroyed. The emperor was charged with starting this fire in order to get the insurance on a stock of dry goods on Main Street. Instead of taking off his crown, hanging it up in the hall, and helping to put out the fire, as other emperors have done time and again, Nero took his violin upstairs and played, I'll meet you when the sun goes down. This occasioned a great deal of adverse criticism on the part of those who opposed the administration. Several persons openly criticized Nero's policy, and then died. A man in those days would put on his overcoat in the morning and tell his wife not to keep dinner waiting. I'm going downtown to criticize the emperor a few moments, he would say. If I do not get home in time for dinner, meet me on the evergreen shore. Nero, after the death of Octavia, married Poppea Sabina. She died afterward at her husband's earnest solicitation. Nero did not care so much about being a bridegroom, but the excitement of being a widower always gratified and pleased him. He was a very zealous monarch, and kept Rome pretty well stirred up during his reign. If a man failed to show up anywhere on time, his friends would look sadly at each other and say, Alas, he has criticized Nero. A man could wrestle with the yellow fever, or the smallpox, or the Asiatic cholera, and stand a chance for recovery. But when he spoke sarcastically of Nero, it was goodbye, John. When Nero decided that a man was an offensive partisan, that man would generally put up the following notice on his office door. Gone to see the emperor in relation to charge of offensive partisanship, meet me at the cemetery at two o'clock. Finally Nero overdid this thing and ran it into the ground. He did not want to be disliked, and so those who disliked him were killed. This made people timid and muzzled the press a good deal. The Roman papers in those days were all on one side. They did not dare to be fearless and outspoken, for fear that Nero would take out his ad. So they would confine themselves to the statement that the genial and urbane Afranius Burrus had painted his new and recherche picket fence last week, or our enterprising fellow townsman Caesar Kazix will remove the tail of his favorite bulldog next week if the weather should be auspicious, or Miss Agrippa Bangaline, eldest daughter of Romulus Bangaline, the great Roman rinkist, will teach the school at Eupatorium Trifoliatum Holler this summer. She is a highly accomplished young lady and a good speller. Nero got more and more fatal as he grew older, and finally the Romans began to wonder whether he would not wipe out the empire before he died. His backyard was full all the time of people who had dropped in to be killed so that they could have it off their minds. Finally Nero himself yielded to the great strain that had been placed upon him, and in the midst of an insurrection in Gaul, Spain, and Rome itself, he fled and killed himself. The Romans were very grateful for Nero's great crowning act in the killing line, but they were dissatisfied because he delayed it so long, and therefore they refused to erect a tall monument over his remains. While they admired the royal suicide and regarded it as a success, they censured Nero's negligence and poor judgment in suiciding at the wrong end of his reign. 
I have often wondered what Nero would have done if he had been Emperor of the United States for a few weeks, and felt as sensitive to the newspaper criticism as he seems to have been. Wouldn't it be a picnic to see Nero cross the Jersey ferry to kill off a few journalists who had adversely criticized his course? The great violin virtuoso and lightweight Roman tyrant would probably go home by return mail, wrapped in tinfoil, accompanied by a note of regret from each journalist in New York, closing with the remark that, In the midst of life we are in death, Therefore now is the time to subscribe. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 The Cowboy So much amusing talk is being made recently about the blood-bedraggled cowboy of the Wild West that I rise as one man to say a few things, not in a dictatorial style, but regarding this so-called or so-esteemed dry-land pirate, who, mounted on a little cow-pony and under the black flag, sails out across the green surge of the plains to scatter the rocky shores of time with the bones of his fellow-man. A great many people wonder where the cowboy, with his abnormal thirst for blood, originated. Where did this young Jesse James, with his gory record and his dauntless eye, come from? Was he born in a buffalo wallow at the foot of some rock-ribbed mountain? Or did he first breathe the thin air along the brink of an alkali pond, where the horned toad and the centipede sang him to sleep, and the tarantula tickled him under the chin with its hairy legs? Careful research and cold, hard statistics show that the cowboy, as a general thing, was born in an unostentatious manner on the farm. I hate to sit down on a beautiful romance and squash the breath out of a romantic dream, but the cowboy who gets too much moist damnation in his system and rides on a gallop up and down Main Street shooting out the lights of the beautiful billiard palaces would be just as unhappy if a mouse ran up his pantaloon leg as you would, gentle reader. He is generally a youth who thinks he will not earn his twenty-five dollars per month if he does not yell and whoop and shoot and scare little girls into St. Vitus's dance. I've known more cowboys to injure themselves with their own revolvers than to injure anyone else. This is evidently because they are more familiar with the hoe than they are with the Smith and Wesson. One night, while I had rooms in the business part of a territorial city in the Rocky Mountain cattle country, I was awakened at about one o'clock a.m. by the most blood-curdling cry of murder I ever heard. It was murder with a big M. Across the street, in the bright light of a restaurant, a dozen cowboys with broad sombreros and flashing silver braid, huge leather chaperos, Mexican spurs and orange silk neckties, and with flashing revolvers, were standing. It seemed that a big, red-faced Captain Kidd of the band, with his skin full of valley tan, had marched into an ice-cream resort with a self-cocker in his hand and ordered the vanilla coolness for the gang. There being a dozen young folks at the place, mostly male and female, from a neighboring hop indulging in cream, the proprietor, a meek Norwegian with thin white hair, deemed it rude and outre to do so. He said something to that effect, whereat the other eleven men of alcoholic courage let off a yell that froze the cream into a solid glacier, and shook two kerosene lamps out of their sockets in the chandeliers. Thereupon the little Y.M.C.A. Norwegian said, "'Gentlemen's, I can't never like dot squeakings and dot kind o' things, and you fellows mit dot leather pants on, and dot funny glows and such a things like dot. Better keep kind of quiet, or I shall call up the policeman mit my telephone.' Then they laughed at him, and cried yet again with a loud voice. This annoyed the ice-cream agriculturist, 
and he took the old axe handle that he used to jam the ice down around the freezer with, and peeled a large area of scalp off the leader's dome of thought, and it hung down over his eyes so that he could not see to shoot with any degree of accuracy. After he had yelled murder three or four times, he fell under an ice-cream table, and the mild-eyed Scandinavian broke a silver-plated caster over the organ of self-esteem, and poured red pepper and salt and vinegar and Halford sauce and other relishes on the place where the scalp was loose. This revived the brave but murderous cow gentleman, and he begged that he might be allowed to go away. The gentle Y.M.C.A. superintendent of the ten-stamp ice-cream freezers then took the revolvers away from the bold buccaneer, and kicked him out through a showcase, and saluted him with a bouquet of July oysters that suffered severely from malaria. All cowboys are not sanguinary, but out of twenty you will generally find one who is brave when he has his revolvers with him. But when he forgot and left his shooters at home on the piano, the most tropical, violet-eyed dude can climb him with the butt-end of a sunflower, and beat his brains out, and splatter them all over that school district. In the wild, unfettered West, beware of the man who never carries arms, never gets drunk, and always minds his own business. He don't go around shooting out the gas, or intimidating a kindergarten school. But when a brave frontier man, with a revolver in each boot, and a bowie down the back of his neck, insults a modest young lady, and needs to be thrown through a plate-glass window and then walked over by the populace, call on the silent man who dares to wear a clean shirt and human clothes. End of chapter 32— Chapter 33 — Stirring Incidents at a Fire Last night I was awakened by the cry of fire. It was a loud, hoarse cry, such as a large adult man might emit from his window on the night air. The town was not large, and the fire department, I had been told, was not so effective as it should have been. For that reason I arose and carefully dressed myself, in order to assist if possible. I carefully lowered myself from my room by means of a staircase which I found concealed in a dark and mysterious corner of the passage. On the streets all was confusion. The hoarse cry of fire had been taken up by others, passed around from one to another, till it had swollen into a dull roar. The cry of fire in a small town is always a grand sight. All along the street, in front of Mr. Pendergast's roller rink, the blanched faces of the people could be seen. Men were hurrying to and fro, knocking the bystanders over in their frantic attempts to get somewhere else. With great foresight, Mr. Pendergast, who had that day finished painting his roller rink a dull roan color, removed from the building a large card which bore the legend, Fresh Paint so that those who were so disposed might feel perfectly free to lean up against the rink and watch the progress of the flames. Anon the bright glare of the devouring element might have been seen bursting through the casement of Mr. Cicero Williams's residence, facing on the alley west of Mr. Pendergast's rink. Across the street the spectator, whose early education had not been neglected, could distinctly read the sign of our esteemed fellow-townsman, Mr. Alonzo Burlingame, which was lit up by the red glare of the flames, so that the letters stood out plainly as follows. Alonzo Burlingame, dealer in soft and hard coal, ice-cream, wood, lime, cement, perfumery, nails, putty, spectacles, and horseradish chocolate caramels and tar roofing, gas fitting and undertaking in all its branches, hides, tallow, and maple syrup, fine gold jewelry, silverware, and salt, glue, codfish, and gents' neckwear, undertaker and confectioner, 
Diseases in Horses and Children a Specialty Juno White Painter The flames spread rapidly, until they threatened the palace rink of our esteemed fellow-townsman, Mr. Pendergast, whose genial and urbane manner had endeared him to all. With a degree of forethought worthy of a better cause, Mr. Leroy W. Butts suggested the propriety of calling out the Hook and Ladder Company, an organization of which every one seemed to be justly proud. Some delay ensued in trying to find the janitor of Pioneer Hook and Ladder Company No. 1's building, but at last he was secured, and, after he had gone home for the key, Mr. Butts ran swiftly down the street to awaken the foreman, but after he had dressed himself and inquired anxiously about the fire, he said that he was not foreman of the company since the 2nd of April. Meanwhile the fire-fiend continued to rise up ever and anon on his hind feet and lick up salt-barrel after salt-barrel in close proximity to the palace rink, owned by our esteemed fellow-citizen Mr. Pendergast. Twice Mr. Pendergast was seen to shudder, after which he went home and filled out a blank which he forwarded to the insurance company. Just as the town seemed doomed, the Hook and Ladder Company came rushing down the street with their navy blue Hook and Ladder truck. It is indeed a beauty, being one of the Excelsior Noiseless Hook and Ladder Factory's best instruments, with tall red pails and rich blue ladders. Some delay ensued, as several of the officers claimed that under a new by-law passed in January they were permitted to ride on the truck to fires. This having been objected to by a gentleman who had lived in Chicago several years, a copy of the by-laws was sent for, and the dispute summarily settled. The company now donned its rubber overcoats with great coolness, and proceeded at once to deftly twist the tail of the fire-fiend. It was a thrilling sight, as James MacDonald, a brother of Terence MacDonald, Trombone, Indiana, rapidly ascended one of the ladders in the full glare of the devouring element, and fell off again. Then a wild cheer arose to a height of about nine feet, and all again became confused. It was now past eleven o'clock, and several members of the Hook and Ladder Company, who had to get up early the next day in order to catch a train, excused themselves, and went home to seek much-needed rest. Suddenly it was discovered that the brick livery stable of Mr. Abraham McMichaels, a nephew of our worthy assessor, was getting hot. Leaving the palace rink to its fate, the Hook and Ladder Company directed its attention to the brick barn, and after numerous attempts at last succeeded in getting its large iron prong fastened on the second-story window-sill, which was pulled out. The hook was again inserted, but not so effectively, bringing down at this time an armful of hay and part of an old horse-blanket. Another courageous jab was made with the iron hook, which succeeded in pulling out about five cents worth of brick. This was greeted by a wild burst of applause from the bystanders, during which the Hook and Ladder Company fell over each other, and added to the horror of the scene by a mad burst of pale blue profanity. It was not long before the stable was licked up by the fire fiend, and the Hook and Ladder Company directed its attention toward the undertaking, embalming, and ice-cream parlors of our highly esteemed fellow-townsman, Mr. A. Burlingame. The company succeeded in pulling two stone window-sills out of this building before it burned. Both times they were encored by the large and aristocratic audience. Mr. Burlingame at once recognized the efforts of the heroic firemen by tapping a keg of beer, which he distributed among them at twenty-five cents per glass. This morning a space forty-seven feet wide, where but yesterday all was joy and prosperity and beauty, is covered over with blackened ruins. Mr. Pendergast is overcome by grief over the loss of his rink but assures us that if he is successful in getting the full amount of his insurance, he will take the money and build two rinks, 
either one of which will be far more imposing than the one destroyed last evening. A movement is on foot to give a literary and musical entertainment at Burley's Hall to raise funds for the purchase of new uniforms for the fire laddies, at which Mrs. Butts has consented to sing when the robins nest again, and Miss Murdy Stout will recite Ostler Joe, a selection which never fails to offend the best people everywhere. Twenty-five cents for each offense. Let there be a full house. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 The Little Barefoot Boy With the moist and misty spring, with the pink and white columbine of the wild wood, and the breath of the cellar and the incense of burning overshoes in the back yard, comes the little barefoot boy with fawn-colored hair and a droop in his pantaloons. Poverty is not the grand difficulty with the little barefoot boy of spring. It is the wild, ungovernable desire to wiggle his toes in the ambient air and to soothe his parboiled heels in the yielding mud. I see him now in my mind's eye, making his annual appearance like a rheumatic housefly, stepping high like a blind horse. He has just left his shoes in the woodshed and stepped out on the piazza to proclaim that violet-eyed spring is here. All over the land the gladiolus bulb and the ice man begin to swell. The south wind and the newborn calf at the barn begin to sigh. The oak tree and the dude begin to put on their spring apparel. All nature is gay. The thrush is warbling in the asparagus orchard, and the prima donna does her throat up in a red flannel rag to wait for another season. All these things indicate spring, but they are not so certain and unfailing as the little barefoot boy whose white feet are thrust into the face of the approaching season. Five months from now, those little dimpled feet, now so bleached and tender, will look like a mud turtle's back, and the superior and leading toe will have a bandage around it tied with a piece of thread. Who would believe that the budding hoodlum before us, with the yellow chilblain on his heel and the early spring toad in his pocket, which he will present to the timid teacher as a testimonial of his regard this afternoon, may be the Moses who will lead the American people forty years hence into the glorious sunlight of a promised land. He may possibly do it, but he doesn't look like it now. Yet John A. Logan and Samuel J. Tilden were once barefooted boys, with a suspender apiece. It doesn't seem possible, does it? How can we imagine at this time Julius Caesar and Hannibal Hamlin and Lucretia Borgia at some time or other stub their bare toes against a root, and fill the horizon with pianissimo wails. The barefoot boy of spring will also proceed to bathe in the river as soon as the ice and the policeman are out. He will choose a point on the boulevard where he can get a good view of those who pass, and in company with eleven other little barefoot boys he will clothe himself in an atom vest, a pair of bare-skin pantaloons, a Greek slave overcoat, and a yard of sunlight, and gaze earnestly at those who go by on the other side. Up and down the bank, pasting each other with mud, the little barefoot boys of spring chase each other, with their vertebrae sticking into the warm and sleepy air, while down in the marsh, where the cattails and the broad flags and the peach can and the deceased horse grow, the bullfrog is twittering to his mate. Later on, the hoarse voice of a rude parental snorter is heard approaching, and twelve slim cupids with sunburned backs are inserted into twelve little cotton shirts, and twelve despondent pairs of pantaloons hang at half-mast to twelve home-made suspenders, and as the gloaming gathers about the old house, twelve boys back up against the ice-house to cool off, 
while the enraged parent hangs up the buggy whip in the old place. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 I Spy Dear reader, do you remember the boy of your school who did the heavy falling through the ice, and was always about to break his neck, but managed to live through it all? Do you call to mind the youth who never allowed anybody else to fall out of a tree and break his collarbone when he could attend to it himself? Every school has to secure the services of such a boy before it can succeed, and so our school had one. When I entered the school I saw at a glance that the board had neglected to provide itself with a boy whose duty it was to nearly kill himself every few days in order to keep up the interest, so I applied for the position. I secured it without any trouble whatever. The board understood at once from my bearing that I would succeed, and I did not betray the trust they had reposed in me. Before the first term was over, I had tried to climb two trees at once, and been carried home on a stretcher, been pulled out of the river with my lungs full of water, and artificial respiration resorted to, been jerked around over the north half of the country by a fractious horse whose halter I had tied to my leg, and which leg is now three inches longer than the other, together with various other little early eccentricities which I cannot at this moment call to mind. My parents at last got so that along about two o'clock p.m. they would look anxiously out of the window and say, "'Isn't it about time for the boys to get here with Williams's remains? They generally get here before two o'clock.' One day five or six of us were playing I Spy around our barn. Everybody knows how to play I Spy. One shuts his eyes and counts one hundred, for instance, while the others hide. Then he must find the rest and say, I spy so-and-so, and touch the goal before they do. If anybody beats him to the goal, the victim has to blind over again. Well, I knew the ground pretty well, and could drop twenty feet out of the barn window and strike on a pile of straw so as to land near the goal, touch it, and let the crowd in free without getting found out. I did this several times, and got the blinder, James Bang, pretty mad. After a boy has counted five hundred or six hundred, and worked hard to gather in the crowd, only to get jeered and laughed at by the boys, he loses his temper. It was so with James Cicero Bang. I knew that he almost hated me, and yet I went on. Finally, in the fifth ballot, I saw a good chance to slide down and let the crowd in again, as I had done on former occasions. I slipped out of the window and down the side of the barn about two feet, when I was detained unavoidably. There was a batten on the barn that was loose at the upper end. I think I was wearing my father's vest on that day, as he was away from home, and I frequently wore his clothes when he was absent. Anyhow, the vest was too large, and when I slid down, that loose board ran up between the vest and my person in such a way as to suspend me about eighteen feet from the ground, in a prominent but very uncomfortable position. I remember it quite distinctly. James C. Bang came around where he could see me. He said, I spy Billy Nye, and touched the goal before him. No one came to remove the barn. No one came to sympathize with me in my great sorrow and isolation. Every little while James Seabang would come around the corner and say, Oh, I see. You needn't think you're out of sight up there. I can see you real plain. You better come down and blind. I can see you up there. I tried to unbutton my vest and get down there and lick James, but it was of no use. It was a very trying time. I can remember how I tried to kick myself loose, but failed. Sometimes I would kick the barn, and sometimes I would kick a large hole in the horizon. Finally I was rescued by a neighbor, who said he didn't want to see a good barn kicked into chaos just to save a long-legged boy that wasn't worth over six bits. 
It affords me great pleasure to add that while I am looked up to and madly loved by every one that does not know me, James C. Bang is brevet president of a fractured bank, taking a lonely bridal tour by himself in Europe and waiting for the depositors to die of old age. The mills of the gods grind slowly, but they most generally get there with both feet. Adapted from the French by permission. End of chapter 35